Well, well, friends, welcome to Lazarus Symposium. I think this is the 33rd symposium in this series, which we kicked off about three years ago. I've set up a, a new studio here, um, which I'm apparently having difficulties with. You can see I've got a very large screen there behind me, and um, I'm able to now save my failing uh, eyesight and look directly at at the screen above my computer. Very, very happy today to be introducing, and you have to give me one minute here because I've got a slight problem with my screen. It has, let me just reset my screen. I've Let's just get Sasha back in. It'll take him two seconds. <laughs> Okay, uh, Christy, give me a thumbs up in the studio. Can you hear me okay? Okay, we're all good. I'm so sorry, friends. <clears throat> I think my, um, I think my um, uh, computer jumped from one, from one, for my, we just installed a Starlink this morning, put it that way. Um, the irony of ironies, we installed a Starlink precisely in order to avoid technical hitches like that. So here we are, uh, Saturday, uh, 30th of March, and this is the 33rd um, Symposium in the Lazarus series. Very, very happy today uh, to be bringing back uh, someone who I, I, I've had a some private, some, uh, held a candle for, for a very, very long time, put it that way. And uh, to those of you who know, know that this woman is anchoring some of the most extraordinary energetics in the world today. I think that she is a, um, a celestial conduit. Um, a great many millions of people agree with me. Uh, there have been a few detractors around the world. Anyone who detracts or throws rocks at me or anyone in the truth and disclosure movement is the one who is in wrong, wrong action. So just bear that much in mind. Um, I'm very, very happy indeed today to bring on to Lazarus again, Elena Danan. Elena, so good to see you. Oh, Sasha, that's so nice what you just said. <laughs> I thought you were introducing Jane. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, my audience know and love Jane very well, but you're you're a rare one. So it's not easy to get you uh, on, but we're just so happy to have you today. And you're joining us from Ireland. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Sasha. And I have to say, I admire your resilience, your dedication to truth, to spiritual disclosure. I right? like, if I may, I call it like this. And uh, well done. Keep up the good work. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, friends. Uh, for those of you who've not yet met Elena Dunan, uh, she is the multifaceted astrophysicist and archaeologist with roots in Marseille, France, enriched by her Greek and Gotlandish heritage. And her life uh, took an extraordinary turn at the age of nine due to an encounter with Zeta Reticula, small grey, uh, leading to a dramatic rescue by the Galactic Federation's Starseed Initiative. Um, the kind of thing, incidentally, that a great many people hawk at and burst out laughing and s s sort of spit their coffee out. But I'll tell you, um, in my own engagement over the years at, at a very high diplomatic level, and again, not to shake a dick, but speaking even to heads of state, um, I have had corroboration, confirmation of these, uh, of these facts. Uh, we are very much known at the highest echelon of leadership in the world military, intelligence, academic, and uh, and so on. It is, that, that's before we even get into the, the clutches of the Vatican and uh, Washington and, and the kind of black nobility, the high echelon that have controlled 
the rollout of not just this civilizational wheel, but multiple civilizational wheels, they have always ever known that the human is, in that sense, the galactic hybrid. And I would say this, that the, the aspect of the human that is the most important is the angelic aspect, the element that, uh, that you and I represent. So we're going to have this incredible conversation with, uh, with Elena Danan. I want to ask a little bit more about that a dramatic rescue by the Galactic Federation Starseed Initiative. But in her best-selling memoir uh, called A Gift from the Stars, Elena recounts her experiences with these extraterrestrial beings. And through her story, she invites us all to explore the vast potential within ourselves and the mysteries of the universe. She's been working uh, lately with another remarkable soul, and that is uh, Dan Willis, who you all know and love as well. Dan, a U.S. Navy veteran who testified about the ET phenomenon in the National Press Club in 2001, part of uh, Dr. Stephen Greer's uh, disclosure um, work, his post-military uh, work uh, with uh, Werner von uh, Werner, I could never know how to pronounce his name, Werner von Braun at Fairchild Industries and his investigative research into ancient advanced technology and geomancy um, offers very unique insights as well. Dan, so happy to have you back, brother. Oh, it's such a pleasure. And, um, and to join my dear friend, Lena, as well. Uh, as you know, I've been researching for many decades, and <clears throat> Lena has multiple scientific corroborating evidences to support her, her uh, credibility of being the emissary for the Galactic Federation of Worlds. And, um, you know, we're all on the same team here. We all want to see our planet liberated and the deceptions exposed and uh, move into a, into a beautiful, new, as Dr. Michael Salas says, our Star Trek future. Yes, indeed. I hope to that. Uh, finally, friends, uh, welcome Jane Evershed. Um, the artist, researcher, activist, and fellow at the New Earth University and uh, supreme grandmother. Where is she? Now, typical, she's disappeared. She's run off somewhere. Um, Christy, see if you can chase her down. Um, and when, when, you, when you see her, when she comes back in, kindly just pop her straight into the studio. I'm on a diminished screen today, so I can't see uh, the green room and the studio at the same time. So I'll be blind to it. But friends, let's crack on. Um, here with Elena Danan and Dan Willis. Very, very happy to be engaging this conversation. Let me, by way of introduction, just say this. As we navigate through this period of, of extraordinary shift and significant um, change um, planetarily, we can reflect on how far we've come. This, this series that we um, began a, a few months ago with uh, Dan and Jane, essentially, um, looking at psyops in history. Uh, it's taken us from complex strategies of the Jesuits to the challenges of, um, of modern pandemics and pushing us to question and reevaluate what so many um, have taken as the norm. So we're moving towards a future where knowledge and understanding lift the veil of fear and control, to be sure. And that's what Revelation is all about, about simply casting light upon that which has been hidden uh, from the light. And that is the function of the living temple, the angelic uh, human, the living temple of the angelic human is a light bearer. We're the ones who put light into the dark, into this cauldron of creation, into this abyss and invoke and conjure uh, into manifestation the highest patterns of perfection. So this today is not just a, a conclusion of what was is the beginning of what's to come awakening to the boundless potential within us as luminous angelic beings um elena what what are, when we talk of psyops psychological operations it's a bit of a reductive uh, thing to speak in terms of psyops i would say the whole of reality in that sense maya the illusion reality the false light matrix is itself the greatest psyop in the history of time what do you think well, psyop, psy psychological operation is a term that encompasses so many things, so many dif different things. And you, res you, you resume it very well in one expression, that the, the illusion of reality, the, the false matrix. And there are so many different psyop that feed and, and make the structure of this, this, this fake matrix. Um, Many of them have been, uh, and Dan Willis is the expert on this, have been um, made up and 
created since the 1940s uh, to stop the disclosure about extraterrestrials and how the governments were involved with them. But there's also recently uh, a new type of psychological operations because the, the, the enemies of humanity had understood that the only way that humanity would be free from this, this slavery is an, a spiritual awakening, awakening to who they truly are, awakening to their own power. And then when they reach out to this, when humans know who they are, then they, they are able to understand the other psyops and, and have discernment. So that was to suddenly the emergency on the top of the others, other psyops. And what it is about, it is about infiltrating the different spiritual movements that gather, gather people on their path of spiritual awakening. So we call it the, the spiritual community or the um, starseed community or great awakening community. All these, these little groups and, and communities, they have been infiltrated by agents or not especially knowing the, what they are doing. There are different levels also in, in this. Um, spreading false narratives that people are going to basically wait for a savior, either person or either event, cosmic event, that they will not do the work themselves because the great awakening of one, one person goes by personal work and it's in an individual work. It's going within and activating our cellular memory. When you are told that you need to wait for a savior, event, or whatever, you stop doing the work. And that's the, the purpose of the, the actual dangerous psyops at the moment. And uh, there are so many we can go over. Beautiful. Thank you. Jane, welcome. Uh, just so you know, you're in the shade. We can't really see your face, but you're a fabulous silhouette. That, that's calibrated better. Thank you. Uh, we just, just began, uh, Jane, just uh, giving a kind of backdrop to the series that we started a few months ago, you, myself, and Dan. I think it's so beautiful and appropriate that we bring Elena's frequency and her very kind of um, psycho-spiritual circumspection into closing this piece on PSYOPs. My question to Elena was, isn't the reality, the false light reality matrix, the biggest PSYOP of all? So she was just waxing uh, on that subject. But um, Jane, thank you for joining us. And this is your introduction to, to the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I don't think you can get any more big picture than Elena Denam, honestly. And that's my favorite thing is stepping back and looking at the biggest picture you possibly can which is why I've been studying our galactic history lately. We're very much missing it. And I'm sorry that I dropped out. You know, over here in Costa Rica, the electricity keeps going off and on and on and off. So please bear with me with that. Very good. Well, wel welcome to the developing world, darling, now that you've left the climbs of uh, North America. Uh, in any event, Dan, um, your reflections, please, as we come to the end of the series on on psychological operations. Do you not believe that the fact of that we know about the PSYOPs, the fact that we are, we've begun to identify so much of the false narrative of how the orchestration of events and circumstances that happen on the screen of our collective life, we're, we've now rumbled the game. We've now worked out that so much of it is orchestration. So in seeing that much of reality is erected on the edifice of psyops, would you agree that we are leaving the realm of psychological operations now as a direct result and moving into a different form of uh, intellectual civilizational upshift? Well, um, only the Galactic Federation of Worlds knows for sure. And apparently uh, one of their last meetings was very encouraging that the number of of the population are becoming awake and uh, then we have our earthly agencies like the uh, NSA <laughs> you know monitoring everybody um, so yeah there's a certain percentage and I believe uh, in the collective consciousness that we're all connected to as more of us awaken um, the uh, 
more exponentially, more of the population becomes awake. And, uh, and from what I'm seeing, it, it looks very encouraging. So, uh, Jane, what, what are your thoughts as well, just on that question that I asked? Do you think that we're seeing the end of, of PSYOPs because, precisely because we've now begun to shed collective light on the subject? Well, I do think everybody is waking up in a collective sense, but then you've got, like today, Biden declared Easter Sunday Transgender Visibility Day. So they're countering as much as they possibly can. And so it's going to be a fight to the end for sure. But I do believe a lot of people are waking up. But we were looking at Ascension itself. We, my, my cadres and I were looking at Ascension and we were thinking that for the possibility of the Eternal Mother to enter into our realm in the way that she should be revered, we were thinking that we would possibly have to ascend before that could even happen because of the stereotypes that have been drummed into our brains so hard and fast for so long, for so many thousands of years. We don't know how to bring back this eternal mother into our realm so that we have this unity consciousness. Well, either that or we fundamentally do know how to resurrect the atom seed of the eternal mother, which represents the unknown, the invisible realm, the supernature. Surely that's the point of reaching this alchemization um threshold at the at the psycho civilizational level there's meltdown going on anyone who can't see that doesn't have a pulse so on in in every aspect of of so-called reality and so-called you know the, the 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 framing of reality it's all it's all melting down it's all reaching that threshold event so i suggest that that is the that is where that eternal flame resurrects and the the upshift occurs precisely because we're in that Helter Skelter. The irony, of course, is that the Illuminati or the, I don't know, maybe I've got my my, my syntax wrong and, uh, and Elena might correct me here, but to speak very simplistically, the Thate, Thetan, Orion, Zeta, Reticulan, Draconian, Sabbatean, Luciferian, um, Saturnian aspect of our false light reality is the backdrop against which has created the compression that brings us to this helter skelter, this abject chaos from which the satanic Luciferian would have us manifest their outcome, but we're doing the opposite. So Elena, I think you, you get what I'm going at there. We are the ones who are now actually gazumping the game that's been played against us. Does that make sense? Yes, um, the, the enemies of humanity, as I like to call all what you've named, uh, and the three-letter agency is uh, the executive operation uh, of them, <laughs> I would say. They know, they know, they knew from the start, from knowledge that that's not from this earth, that humans of earth have a power of manifestation, have the power, the creative power upon reality. They've been hiding that to us the best ways they could with religions, etc. Psyops, of course. Uh, the secret is that they've been hiding from us about ourselves is that we have, by our thoughts, a power of thoughts, the, the ability to modify and create uh, alter the, the web, the structure, the holographic structure of reality. So any any emotion, and the emotion is the key, any emotion that they, they put in our head, like fear, for instance, they broadcast narratives of fear, fear porn, as we call it. And we are going to project this frequency of fear uh, into the web of reality, and we are going to create it. They are unable to, to modify the reality. We are. So they are going to influence us to create the reality they want. That is why I am, I am really fighting uh, for a long time to tell people, stop giving into the fear narrative. You have the power to create your own reality. That's the secret.
So uh, plasma harvesting, uh, attention, you know, the photons that come out of our attention uh, from the pineal, which is connected to the kundalini, which is the conduit of life force connecting us to our supernature, alpha omega. So every human being in that sense becomes a living um, plasma charged uh, uh, capacitor that is able to output limitless, limitless amounts of creation energy. And if we direct our attention towards objective A, that's what manifests. If we direct it to objective B, that's what manifests. So the battle then becomes in the realm of the imagination and the capacity to which we can step back ourselves from the thrall of fear, step into our own supernature, take command and control of our own capacity to imagine or dream wisely. And at the collective level, that becomes an unstoppable force which shapes worlds, more or less. Yes, and once we realize all of this, because knowledge is power and you cannot unknow what you know, once we got to that, that point, they're done. <laughs> because we are going to use this power to create the world we want. Because, wait, wait a minute. I, I want a better world for my children. You know, I, I'm, I'm going to manifest it and it works. Right, right. And you know, the, the argument I've made as an activist for so many years, I've literally for 20 years, I've been begging people, stop paying personal income tax. Just stop doing it. That's your input. It's time, motion, energy into coin, which represents life force. You pay that to Caesar, you take the knee to Caesar, and so it goes on. So restructure, recalibrate your life in such a way that your personal income tax is not tethered to Cronus and to the way that evil becomes manifest in this world, war, disease, poverty, blah, blah, blah. So that's a, a mechanistic function, uh, but it's even difficult for people to comprehend that, let alone for them to comprehend the fact that they have the capacity to dream wisely and manifest uh, heaven on earth. Dan, in all of the psyops that we've discussed in the last uh, few months, what which ones come to mind to, to the fore of, uh, forefront of your mind in respect of how, how those operations have shaped um, our consciousness globally as a species? Uh, unquestionably, our... Our mainstream media, our mainstream media, you know, people, when you're a child, you uh, watch television with your parents and your parents didn't question <laughs> the, the validity of the information and you just naturally grow into adulthood and assume that. And fortunately, there's a lot of um, people that are seeing the, the glitches, I guess you could say, in the matrix and starting to question. The information because they see certain things happen in the world and they see the uh, the information con conflicting with that and so they start to say, well something's not quite right here so they start to look outside you know like when i testified in washington i didn't even know what operation mockingbird was you know here was like you know 22 cameras in the back row uh we're talking to the mainstream media of the world and we're revealing um you know, incredible information that uh, would have been a world-changing event. And I uh, I naively uh, thought it was going to be a world-changing event. But uh, then I became aware of uh, a long history of infiltra infiltration into controlling our perceptions, not only in our education system and mainstream media. Um, yeah, that... That's that's the number one for me. <laughs> right, very good. Yeah, I, I think I'd pr probably, I would say it's religion. For me, it would be religion, religiosity, how that managed to shape um, us in such a monumental way. But in that sense, media, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram is the new religion. It is the new Catholicism in that sense. Well, I was lucky I dodged that bullet, <laughs> you know, on religion. <laughs> we'll make so, you famous uh, on Facebook. Yet, Dan, don't you worry. <laughs> Jane, your your reflections again. Same question. Uh, what are the first one or two um, psyops that come to your mind that you believe have shaped outside of um, mainstream media and religion? Well, I think the biggest one of all was the ritual of the Nagasaki and Hiroshima bombs as a death cult trinity put into our system and, uh, and 
beyond that, we've just had war after war after war after war. That was a satanic ritual to gear us to actually accept the killing yeah. of our own species on a grand scale, including the women who give birth to children who would go to war to help build those ammunitions up to send over there. We were so psyched out and we killed our own. So just to nor it, nor it really normalized mass sacrifice of innocence in that sense. Absolutely, in the hundreds of thousands at once with every B-2 bomber that dropped bombs over Japan. Yeah. Uh, Dan, I understand that you've got a short uh, presentation for us. Is that correct? Oh, <laughs> I didn't know I was first in line. Um, yes, I do. Uh, oh, I'm not, why, I didn't have why? enough time to actually time it. It might be, um, might go into 10 minutes or something like that. Uh, but uh, we'll see. It's a virgin run. This, but I tell you, I tell you what, I tell you, what, hold off for five minutes, cue, cue yourself up there. Before that, I just want to ask a question of Elena, which is what, whilst we're on the subject, Elena, I want to ask you to discuss briefly the role of extraterrestrial narratives within the framework of PSYOPs. Um, Dan alluded to Dr. Stephen Greer's um, disclosure project, which he believed some years ago, as did I. I mean, I was also watching that, Dan, you know, and I genuinely thought, well, here we go, folks, strap in, put your seatbelts on. Finally, it's out. Finally, you know, the albelix of this world and, you know, all of these extraordinary whistleblowing characters finally have um, an artery that's going to bring in, bring them into the mainframe. Well, boy, did that disappoint all of us. But Elena, what are your thoughts? I mean, the role of extraterrestrial narratives within the framework of psyops. How do these uh, ET narratives shape our collective consciousness and affect um, societal norms? Well, that's a vast subject. Try to be um, compact. Um, the the, the extraterrestrials have been involved in the history of humanity since the dawn of time, but what concerns our modern time with disclosure? The extraterrestrials, there's, there, are, there, is a, there was a negative uh, faction, two negative factions of, of extraterrestrials. The Orion Greys called themselves the Dominion or the Nebu, and also the Dra what we call the Draco Reptilians or Sikar. These both allied for profit interest to and to have a agree, pass agreement with the, the dark faction of the, the, the Earth governments. You have one side, the Draco Reptilian, made deals with the Nazis, and the Nebu from Orion made deals with, I would say, more the dark governments, the more the, the American um, MJ-12, and they, they started to, at the end, they both allied uh, for interest at the end of the Second World War. The, the purpose was uh, profit from humans. The greys would be on Earth conducting hybridization experiments and everybody would profit on it. And basically the MJ-12 uh, sold humanity behind Eisenhower's back and will uh, to these, these nefarious ETs. So, Taking only that, the, the deep state and the enemies of humanity, they, they do not want us to know about that. So they're going to say, oh, that, that that's BS. That never happens. And um, th so these ones who said, there, oh, all ETs are good. There is no bad ETs. Uh, that, that's nothing. Nothing happens. Pass your way, you know. Uh, that would be one psyop. There, all ETs are good. And then there would be another uh, psychological operation that would come more from the, 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 the Nazi German side. And Werner von Braun uh, just spoke about that. Uh, the, the operation Operation Blue Beam with uh, fake good aliens who would come to, to save humanity. There would be a fake invasion and a fake salvation with holographic show. Uh, all of this to... Uh, drive humanity to unite to a new world order. It will be all manipulation. To my to my papers, this will not occur. Uh, so that's the main uh, psyop from the enemies of humanity. But the thing is, since 2021, all these nefarious ETs have been expelled from our star system. Uh, 
This is the information I, I brought, but I'm not the only one. This information was confirmed uh, later, a year or so, by, uh, for instance, uh, um, someone, I forget his name, in a high position in the Arlington Institute, Dan, <laughs> Dan keep the records of all the stuff. <laughs> um, so there is no more bad aliens in our star system now. They're gone. But now we need to be careful about the, the so-called alien invasion. They try to, to pass this kind of psyop through the Hollywood movies. The aliens are going to invade Earth. That's not going to happen because now it's safe. But so now any good aliens, such as the Galactic Federation of Worlds, who have been protecting humanity and warning humanity since a very long time, when they are planning to make a civilian contact, uh, the mainstream media would say, oh, these are the bad aliens, we need to kill them and don't trust them, you know? And that's another level of PSYOP. So um, it's different layers, different um, things. So would worth three hours talking about it. <laughs> Yeah, well, exactly, exactly right. I mean, you mentioned you mentioned Majestic Twelve a moment ago, and because um, that really, in a sense, was the genesis genesis point of how we started on on Earth to compartmentalize, highly compartmentalize, and sequester this engagement with the extraterrestrials. And I'm, when I say that, I'm talking about the malevolent engagement with extraterrestrials because and correct me if i'm wrong but it seems to me that back in the day in the 1950s essentially into the early 60s when mj12 was really the ground central um for this kind of hyper compartmentalized control of engagement with extraterrestrials and those um secret uh, operations black operations henry uh, kissinger of course i think we've got a, a picture here somewhere of Henry Kissinger, help me out here, Christy, please. There we go, at the bottom there. Uh, you know, th this, this ghastly uh, creature here, um, absolute heinous, nefarious, perfidious creature who slithered off the planet um, very recently, but perfectly, perfectly embodies um, this element that we're talking about, the, 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 the deviant patriarch, the one that decided to uh, take control and containment of all the information, the technology, the wisdom, the esoteric arts, the Babylonian, you know, all of that stuff. So Majestic 12 came in. Do you believe now that Kissinger is dead, that MJ 12 and that kind of um, command central is completely gone? Has has that morphed into something else? No, they have uh, they have shifted into something else, and uh, I'm not the expert in the matter. Maybe Dan can talk about this better. But th there's something, Sasha. Quickly, um, I try to be quick. I, I want to add because um, I, we were talking, you were asking me about the spiritual movement infiltration, and that is when uh, I can mention um, that there are psyops about ETs, and I can name them. You have, for instance, the, the counter-narrative to uh, blurry take people away from the Galactic Federation of Worlds, who have been working with the US Navy since the 1950s, even late 40s. The Galactic Federation of Light, this doesn't exist. This is an invention, psyop invention, and people are very confused, very confused. And that's the aim, to confuse people. And the Galactic Federation of Light is an invention. There's a lot of uh, gray nebu uh, behind it. Um, and it's, it's promoting the salvation agenda that you need to wait for a solar flash or cosmic event that will never happen. And that, I mean, that you, you know, you need to... Uh, just sit and wait. Uh, there are horrible psyops that that I, I think it's really cruel. Some things are like it is are going to come and save us because the earth is going to split in two. Hello, <laughs> but you can't take your pets with you. I mean, that's totally my lab <laughs> MK Ultra technique. It's MK Ultra techniques. I mean, and people are completely desperate. You know, if you're 
good spiritual soldier and you do how we do we say you will get on these ships what ship the ships that will come and rescue everyone what that sounds like a culling hello uh and uh, the the jerusalem ship it, it's it's uh it's 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 imaginary and all these things and ashtar um ashtar shiran and all these uh then they take they use names of ascended masters and they mix it in it like yeshua yeah you have you hear about uh saint german sananda on my website i listed them all on the the elenadanan.org slash debunk you go there you find the list beautiful dan um take it away thank you elena that was beautiful I'm giving you the, the floor here, Dan. Whenever the truth comes out, how do you hide the truth? You, you come out with counter narratives that uh, muddies the water. So the people who haven't spent time, you know, over decades researching this, looking at the authenticated classified documents, looking at all the witness testimonies, a person who doesn't have the background to pull from they're easily swayed. Oh, they don't know, you know, what, what's what. And so uh, it effectively works. So, um, well, I put together a slide presentation just yesterday. <laughs> so I haven't had a chance to uh, actually do a dry run with it. But uh, uh, should I go ahead and, uh, and enter Absolutely. into that? Absolutely. Uh, yes, indeed. All right. Um, I hope yep, nobody please. has copy, copyrighted this term um okay here we go are we seeing a slideshow are you going to be showing something on your screen yes i'm uh accessing it right now okay hopefully no one else has got this term okay can you see that yes 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 carry on yeah. <laughs> okay uh this is, this is planetary liberation style all right. Uh, as we talked earlier about the power of imagination, you know, since we are, as Elena said, we're all creative beings. We're all fractals of source. Um, that's the one thing they're incredibly afraid of, is that uh, we use our collective powers to create the reality that we want to see. So um, I invite everybody to imagine this. Situation on Earth, the year is 2024, and the planet Earth having been technologically and psychologically hijacked for many decades by a cabal of dark criminal elements using psychological warfare, has at long last begun its process of liberation from the deceptions perpetrated upon the people of this planet. The people of the planet have been deceived and divided against each other due to the cabal's centralized control of the information in the media. So a plan was made. Fortunately, benevolent elements within our military a long time ago realized these treasonous elements would continue to per perpetrate its dark agenda unless intervened against, and so a plan was made. The problem with implementing the plan was that due to the dark cabal's control of the media, it had weaponized the public's perceptions so that any military action would be viewed as an illegal hostile force against the people rather than liberating them from the dark cabal's control. Because the media had been weaponized, the full truth of the situation could not be exposed. Alternative media outlets on the internet, like yours, Sasha, outside the cabal's control, helped greatly a certain percentage of critical thinking of the population that sensed something was not quite right. While still the rest of the population could not and would not believe that their trusted media sources have been infiltrated and controlled to have them support a Kapal's agenda, that is ultimately being used against them. Anyone who questioned the media's narrative would be labeled as a baseless conspiracy theorist and an extremist spreading dangerous disinformation, which is number one on their list. You can't tell the people about this. You have to show them. The benevolent elements within the military realize that unless the people were united in understanding what has been perpetrated upon them, that no action against the criminals of humanity would be able to happen without their consent and approval of the majority of the people. So 
it was decided to allow the cabal to continue forward on, on its agenda and allow those who once trusted the media to see with their own eyes the cabal's hidden agenda being exposed for all to see. A turning point occurred where the cabal no longer was attempting to be secret with its plans against humanity. They were exposed in their plans to dramatically reduce the population to a smaller, more controllable slave force, which they could then control by controlling their food supply. Once they became obvious to a greater percentage of the population, their false propaganda on their controlled media outlets became more and more transparent to the people. The tipping point to this was to use the rule of law. At this tipping point in this war against humanity, the military using the rule of law as previously established by the Law of War Manual had accumulated substantial, unequivocal evidence against these criminals of humanity. But first, before the roundup of them to be brought before an international criminal court, the public needed to be fully informed to gather their consent to these criminals being tried for their crimes. So, this first had to seize the media. To circumvent the cabal's interference with the control of the mainstream media and the internet, the United States Marines were deployed to secure the corporate facilities from interfering with a historic public service broadcast on all media outlets. Seizure of the media. On the online news media, radio, and social media ser services were also seized. Utilizing the emergency alert system, which provided communication capability to address the nation during a national emergency, it required all radio and television broadcasters, cable TV, wireless cable systems, satellite operators, to provide capability to address the people during a national emergency. This effectively bypassed the mainstream media's controlled news to all U.S. citizens. A period of public enlightenment. During this time, a state of national emergency was declared and martial law was put in place. Normal television programming was interrupted for eight hours a day for 10 days, revealing to the public the history of this cabal and their criminal plans they had for humanity, showing incontrovertible proof of their crimes. The world unites. The world becoming aware that they have been deceived and played by the criminals of humanity, now united in recognizing its true enemy and to bring justice and liberation of our planet. With all the criminals of humanity identified and apprehended, the international criminal court trials were televised to the world as each criminal was brought forth and appropriately sentenced for their crimes against humanity. The world celebrates. Now, with the criminals of the cabal no longer in places of power and influence, massive changes were now allowed to happen in a benevolent way for all of the people of Earth. Across the planet, there is great joy and celebration for the liberation of Earth from these dark forces against humanity. The Great Reset begins. Now, after decades of secrecy and deception perpetrated upon the people of Earth, with the people now fully aware of the Cabal's nefarious plans they had for them, are grateful for their liberation from these dark elements, which will now allow the world to catch up and bring forth the world that has been taken from them for many decades. So now the world enters into a great reset in a way that benefits all the people of Earth rather than enslaving them as the cabal had planned. Advanced technologies released. The Invention Secrecy Act that had been suppressing thousands of inventions since the 1950s are now able to be released to benefit humanity. Electrical power, zero point energy systems now replace obsolete, dangerous, polluting sources of nuclear oil and coal as nuclear and coal power plants are decommissioned to be retrofitted with clean, non-polluting zero-point energy plants to power all of the homes and businesses that are 
connect it to the power grid. While the people are still connected to the power grid, mass robot manufacturing of small, compact, zero-point energy generators are being produced by the millions so that every home and business can disconnect from the grid independently in a decentralized manner. Eventually, every home and business was disconnected from the grid, which allowed removal and recycling of all the ugly transmission lines strung across the planet. Transportation. The internal combustion engines, uh, which will be phased out, could be, with a simple modification, made to run on hydrogen from water, eliminating the need for gasoline and pollution during the transition. Electric vehicles could have their storage batteries replaced with onboard zero-point energy generators, which run indefinitely the electric motor and never needs to be recharged. New generation vehicles are not only self-powered, but do not require wheels and tires, as anti-gravity technologies allow these vehicles to go where there are no roads. Transportation. The airline industry is now utilizing the anti-gravity technology to transport humans from one place on the planet to another, not hours, but in minutes. Space travel to other planets and the hub outside of Jupiter is now a reality in interacting with other galactic cultures in our galaxy. Teleportation is also another option to move from one location to another instantaneously. Communications. A new quantum communication system utilizing the principles of quantum entanglement replaces the distance limited and biologically harmful electromagnetic communication systems. The obsolete cell phone towers across the planet are being dismantled. Internet. The new quantum internet allows practically instantaneous secure access to greater data from any location. The obsolete transmissions over Wi-Fi and fiber optic cable is replaced. Financial. A new quantum financial system replaces our easily corruptible monetary system that has been used by the cabal to control the world. All bank accounts and of citizens are transitions out of control of the corrupt banking system into the control of the people. Medical. The corrupt medical and pharmaceutical corporations that operate for profit are totally replaced with the release of advanced holographic medical technologies, alleviating all suffering from sickness and disease. Lifespans can now be realized into the hundreds of years. Overpopulation is not a concern with remote areas now able, able to be habitable, as well as off-planet colony locations. The basic needs of food, water, shelter, and clothing are now available to everyone. Food is now abundant and healthy and is no longer being weaponized for a eugenics agenda. Contact with other worlds. For many decades, the cabal has denied the existence of extraterrestrial contact to the people and the fact that the Germans working with the corporations of the military industrial complex had developed anti-gravity craft that was used in their secret space program and had infiltrated to the had infiltrated to control our perceptions through the information systems and space agency to hide that reality. While our U.S. Navy developed its own secret space program and entered into an alliance with benevolent off-planet cultures of the Galactic Federation of Worlds. Our planet, now liberated from the dark criminal elements as well as their regressive extraterrestrial overlords that Elena mentioned, can now no longer detrimentally affect the billions of lives on Earth ever again. This allows our planet to evolve peacefully and therefore being governed by a benevolent planetary council permits our world to join the Galactic Federation of Worlds and allows the people of Earth to benefit from the knowledge and wisdom of cultures thousands of years in evolution. Looking back at the past challenges, children now studying through a vast library depository of knowledge are looking back through history at the tremendous challenges that the people of Earth face that has brought them to today's world. Gratitude for the new world. The people vowed to never allow this to ever happen again to their beloved planet and are filled with gratitude for all those who contributed in the past to reset the path to the beautiful new world they now experience. End of story. Ta da! <laughs> oh, brilliant. Sorry. There I am catching up on production notes there. Beautiful. Thank you so very much indeed. Oh, Lord, we've lost Jane again. Are you there, Jane? 
Yes, I'm here. Juanita, Juanita Bonita, can you hear me? I can hear you. <laughs> can you not hear me? Now I can hear you, your reflections on that presentation. Well, this is where creation currency comes in, our valuable creation currency, because we're going to really need it for all of these new technologies and everything. We're all going to be getting very busy making all these dreams for our future possible. So we have to go into high gear and get our creation neurons fired up in our brains and do everything we can to realize the fact that um, artistry and the aesthetics of the earth is about to change so drastically that we are going to need all of our creative capacity in order to fulfill these dreams and these new technologies coming forward. But at the same time, we have to recognize when we're putting our creation currency into the old agenda, we have to withdraw our energy and our creativity from that agenda in order to move forward on behalf of the angelic human race to make it happen. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, Elena, I wanted to ask you, and I promised the audience um, earlier in, in a drop, media drop that I would uh, ask you again the, the question to recount your first engagement with, with the Zeta Reticuli. And I do so for a reason, because um, although the subject matter of alien interventionism and, and genetic manipulation and, you know, all that, the, the fact that the human is the galactic hybrid, that stuff that is very commonplace in our circles, our echelon. But for, for those people who are new to this whole subject matter and who are having a major psycho-spiritual kind of crash and burn complex, it's happening to a lot of souls around the world right now, especially the more mundane um, let's say the more mundane religious mind is having to disassemble itself from from so much cult programming in what is normal, what is you know Darwinism, theory of evolution, you know, having this kind of Christian, Muslim, uh, Hindu, Buddhist, religious, iconic. I, I mean, re, put it this way: religion is idolatry. Mainstream religion is pure idolatry. It's false light worship. It's cult programming, and what it's managed to do in the mainframe is essentially dislocate billions of souls, hundreds of millions, if not billions of souls, from their flame of truth, from their true knowing and their true being. And now that we're going through this calamity, end of days stuff, mRNA intervention, apocalypse playing out, calamity, geoengineering, call it what you will, it's still an apocalypse for many. Um, People need to hear the kind of Pacific voice that you represent in the world. One, you're a highly ac accomplished academic. You're a field researcher. You're someone who goes out there. You've not sat behind a desk. You've been in the bowels, in the deserts, under the Sphinx, in the pyramids in Egypt. You've been on the front line of academic inquiry in the field. You are an exceptional soul. You, you, you very courageously, I believe, positioned yourself in the flame of pure truth. You are a direct conduit to the Galactic Federation. You're a direct conduit uh, to the our Anunnaki um, God-King complex. You are in direct communion there. So you've got a very unique voice. And because of the way that you, you speak to these subjects, you get the attention of even the pedestrian and the mundane mind they'll actually listen to you they'll give you their attention they won't listen to me less necessarily so speaking to that mindset speaking to that mindset that religious pedestrian christian mindset um who are just listening into this broadcast there's a hell of a lot of people watching incidentally We've got a huge audience today huge audience what do you how do you explain your your genesis into this arena how do you explain your first your first interaction with Zeta Reticula. Can you just go take us back to that story and walk us through it psychologically, emotionally, spiritually? Well, this unfortunate event that happened when I was nine years old uh, gave me a voice to come forward on the stage of disclosure. And then the rest of my mission unfolded. 
this was a horrible uh, physical event that happened to me when I was nine years old. I was, as many, many millions of children are, abducted by small gray aliens from Zeta Reticuli. And I was taken on board a ship and I was, you know, they did horrible things to me. Uh, uh, that I is described in my book are quite difficult to talk about, but they they butchered me a, a little bit. And um, well, I was being prepared to be part of the hybridization program, like all the little girls are that they abduct. But I was rescued in the process on that gray ship by uh, two men, two tall blonde Nordic aliens um in space suit they beamed on board and they there was a fight and they rescued me and they brought me on board their ship they teleported me there and they took care of me there was a whole crew on that new ship and this ship i learned later was part of the galactic federation of worlds and these people conduct a lot of rescue of children and i was one of them I also had a link with my rescuers. Uh, one of them was part of my soul group. So that's why uh, this person was following me. So these people, these members of the Galactic Federation of Worlds, their name was uh, Thorhan Eredion, Valnek Oroyan, uh, Myra and Seladion. These, uh, I have kept this uh, story secret all my life until 2019 when I decided to come forward and write a book that was published in early 2020, A Gift from the Stars, where I, with my own artworks as well, I depict everything that happened to me and how these um, positive uh, it is uh, from the Federation kept contact with me physically. That's very important. I'm not a channeler. I'm not a downloader. I'm not a new age person. I'm a physical contactee. I'm a physical experiencer since childhood. These people would beam in my bedroom physically or they would beam me on board their ship physically and I would go for trips in space. They would show me the, the commands of the ship. They, I would be familiarized with all this universe since for I was a child. And uh, when it became, became more serious later, when my I remembered who I was and my mission activated, when they took me on board the ship in 2018, again, after a while, where I had no contact for a few years, and they say now uh, extraordinary things are going to happen for Earth, and we are very excited. So we are going to reactivate your memory, and you're going to come forward to operate your mission. Little did I know at that moment, it was in 2018, and, uh, well, you know, Dark Knight of the Soul, etc. And I remember who I was. And at that moment, they made me the emissary of the Galactic Federation. It's physical. All the messages I get are by uh, technology or physical contact. And I want to make the, the point is very important. I, I'm not a channeler, and uh, I'm, uh, I know who I'm talking to because I'm, I'm, I have physical encounters. So um, that's my genesis in the disclosure. What, what percentage of humanity um, do you believe have been abducted or had, had some kind of first contact experience, even if they don't? remember it in the way that you've been reprogrammed to remember and have that fluid quantum memory. Um, many people are contacted and are engaged in or have been engaged, let's say, in hybridization, in uh, experimentation and so on. Would you say it's 10 percent, 50 percent, 100 percent of humanity? What's your takeaway on that? Uh, regarding alien abduction by the, the nefarious ETs, um, there's been millions millions per, per year since the 1950s, 1955, the agreement uh, with the, the MJ-12, the Greys. Um, oh, I'd say maybe 10, 20 per 20 percent of humanity, probably. You know, uh, I'm not, it's very vague number. That's regarding abductions. Now you have another form of, of contact, okay? There's a lot of people on Earth who have, who are envoys, some call many call themselves star seeds uh, we call them envoys the envoys are part of programs to come and incarnate in these times of change to help humans of earth the real humans 
to shift into their true sovereignty and liberate themselves. So all the star seeds come from somewhere else, but it is not about them. It is not about the envoys. They are here to assist the humans. What we celebrate, let us not forget, is the, the, and the indigenous human souls from the Earth planetary matrix. These are the important ones that we are coming to assist. Very good. Is it fair to say that every single human being is a galactic hybrid? I mean, that, that's, that's a self-explanatory statement, right? Oh yes, that 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 because that is true because regarding the sixty five thousand uh, sorry sixty five million years ago, when the we call them the Patal, the Cedars, the Galactic, the Intergalactic Confederation came and uh, decided to help Earth go back to a natural state because at that moment the earth was taken by reptilians so they they leveled zero ground zero and they allowed all the the life to strive again in all balance and every type of life had their chance and at that moment that was the first step and then they came back to help engineer the first humans from a local creature um, that was an experiment they are cedars of life so we're all hybrids. Right, very good. And is it safe to say, right, we're all hybrids. Is it safe to say that there are absolutely categorically no further any um, abductions, that kind of interventionism has ceased and desists all, altogether, correct? From the bad it is, yes, it has ceased. But there has been a, a program that was a really, really vast and 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 important, the the MyLab, the uh, military abductions. This was operated by the deep state, especially in the United States, in what we know as the dumps, deep underground military bases. This was this this was a place where the the the, the, the U.S. Air Force mainly was conducting um, human experiment in collaboration also with the the. the what became of the Nazis after the war, you know, Operation pa Paperclip. Well, this, all these guys were working together and together with the Greys. So these, there was a program where Grey hybrids were engineered. And so people would be abducted by a spaceship with Greys, little Greys in it. But these ones wouldn't be taken in space they would be brought into the military underground bases because these hybrids would belong to the human military, okay? And they would do operations there. And people, many abductees recall to wake up in an underground base and see human militaries around them and they don't understand. I mean, a second before they were on a spaceship. So, and this may, may continue. Some, there are some, um, a little bit of this, but this is the end of it. This is the end of it. It's only human abductions, only human abductions, but it's touching an end. Very good. Um, we are breaking up a little bit, Elena, just so you know. Um, we, we're, we're getting you breaking up ever so slightly. Dan, are you hearing me okay? I'm hearing you fine. I noticed when uh, someone's speaking, oh, there's good. a uh, little sound artifact echoing in the background if I, I think if everyone mutes when someone's speaking and might solve that okay fine so what i i wanted to throw something up here um and i wanted to i've got a whole series of these uh photographs from the buchechi mountain underground uh, alien base that was discovered a number of years ago um and was put out by Radu, um, I can't remember the surname, a remarkable, remarkable soul. Um, I know from my own engagement with the military um, intelligence community in Romania, I know the veracity, the truth of this scenario. Um, I'm painfully aware of it. Uh, the, the whole of the Bucetchi facility has been um, sequestered and locked down uh, by um, US slash NATO military uh, forces. 
So there's no access to the perimeters, certainly no access into the facility. But the images, um, I want to run through a series of these images. And Elena, this is a very uh, um, a selfish on my part. I wanted to show you these images as a reminder so that I could possibly invite you to communicate the next time you are in direct communication uh, with uh, Enlil. I'd be deeply grateful if you would qualify a question that I have, a burning question about this particular underground alien facility in Romania. It is my intimation that this is connected to the genesis point of where Nin Hersag was involved in the scientific hybridization of the seeding of humanity. I, I've got a deep in, in, uh, intimation and intuition that this facility in Romania was arguably the Anunnaki or an Anunnaki scientific facility. And I'd be so grateful if you could look at these photographs and then as and when you're able to have the communication confirm whether or not Romania, the Bucheci mountain facility was indeed connected to the genesis point of the seeding of humanity through the Anunnaki. These are the images. I'm just going to go through them here. Um, quite extraordinary images, I have to say. I can't speak to any of them, really, other than to say that the cave systems are up to almost one and a half kilometers in height. Um, so they have their entire kind of biosphere going on down there with geoluminescence and all sorts of bizarre um, discoveries have been made. These were the initial images, photographic images that were leaked out of the facility. I believe these are huge effigies. The tunnel systems, we're told, um, extend through to other continents from under the Bucheci Mountains. I, end, I think that there's five different directional tunnels. They are monumental in scale. The laboratory, the main laboratory, I don't know if we've got an image of it here, but um, was built for giants. The tables are about three meters in height. Um, and apparently there's some kind of a button on the main laboratory table, whereupon when you place your hand on it, it catalyzes something, arguably through the blood song or the DNA resonance, and then activates some kind of holographic projection into a dome which is the main laboratory. And as I understand it, it creates some kind of plasmoid holographic imagery, which takes the individual on a journey into understanding their own cosmogenesis. So it threads the whole tapestry of their soul to the resonance of their DNA in the present moment. And they're able to actually move through this extraordinary holographic projection. Um, so that's something which I've been told occurs uniformly that's a pyramid inside or pyramids inside the cave system so these pyramids extend upward i think about a quarter of a kilometer in a straight line upward and then go even higher to about 1.2 kilometers until you hit the the top of the underground alien facility or the, the cave system yeah, interesting it looks like a 60 degree angle doesn't it lena Yes, yes. Well, I when you finish, I can really help you with that. Um, okay. We talk about that. That's another image there of the pyramids. So some of the technology seems to be paramagnetic, um, stone-based silica-based and others or metalloidal some sort of some sort of non-corruptible alloy 
given that these must be hundreds of thousands of years old at the very least. I think, I think that's an image of the holographic projection dome. And again, the reason why I think this is actually interesting and in context is because of the work that you guys are doing. I mean, you know, we talk about this. <laughs> my This is my Vajra this. <laughs> from um, Southeast Asia, from Indonesia. Right, exactly. And you guys are at the forefront of resurrecting this creation technology with the work that you're doing, which I'm certainly planning on helping you to get out as widely as possible. But the Vajra Dorj, you know, Another question here, was was there red mercury involved in this technology in, in some sense? Was there red mercury involved? Not. Okay. No, no. No, it's what, a what, what, what was on the inside. What was in the center point? What was this component? So the center point is a sphere that contains um a crystal ball in crystal quartz crystal sphere in it and the sphere right. by itself the metallic sphere which is, is metallic has um, a mechanism that when you press it it's an exponential pressure that is going to compress uh, exponentially with a tremendous strength the crystal that is in the middle but because the, the pressure is applied uniform uniformly uh, around the, the, the crystal the crystal will not breach or break, but it will create a compression compression wave that will be so powerful that it will create a piezoelectric effect that will ignite the plasma that is in the tubes on the side. It will create a spark of plasma, a very powerful spark. And you know the prongs when, when you press it suddenly, clack, the prongs open, and it has a crystal uh, point at the end of it. So the, the, the plasma is going to ignite the crystal and the crystal is going to project uh, a plas plasmic beam of, of, of energy either side. It's, it's a double laser sword like in, in Star Trek, in Star Wars, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, it's like it's Luke Skywalker, yes. destruction, yeah. anti-destruction, right? Right. And both are destructive. Both are destructive. It's a, it's a weapon. It's a weapon that was very common among the Anachim. Now they, they, it's a relic for them. They do not use this anymore. It's a, it's a relic from the past, but they used to have these weapons. Yes, yes. And okay, so I've been misrepresenting, and I apologize to members of my audience who've been misled by my um, bumbling ignorance. It was my understanding that this technology was both a creation and a destruction technology and could be used uh, to ideate and manifest no no not not uh, not really it's a, it's a, it's a weapon uh, after that you can put a um, symbolical um vision on this object because this object resembles the tree of life it can be really right. subject to meditation uh, but that's the, the physical visual aspect of it in fact, it was a deadly weapon. Deadly weapon. Okay, very good. And Luke Skywalker used it um, purely as a defensive technology to kill or to defend. So again, it wasn't something which was manifesting uh, things into the realm. It was something to protect and defend, to use for yes. protection and defense. So what, yes. is the, what is the difference now between this technology, uh, the Vajra Dorj, and um, and the technology which you and Dan are working on, which you've been transcoding from the Galactic Federation, from Jen Han Aradion, and you were taking forward this crystal, uh, a Vogel crystal with a 52 and 60 degree lattice work cut angle, uh, and you hold that technology, and again, you compress it, and it's got other elements there which Dan will speak to momentarily, but once you've got that technology, it's calibrated to a unique quantum frequency, which is a creation frequency. And that is something that will manifest into the field positive impact. Yes? Yes. I, I mean, I will let Dan Willis um, explain f the further about this. I just wanted to, uh, to, to say, I know you're very excited. I'm very excited as well to have this conversation. You ask me, 
uh, insight about the busage. Uh, first, I'm communicating with Enki. I certainly not going to communicate with Enlil, who is the evil I'm twin. I'm so sorry. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, yeah, no, you know, and your tongue just slip, but to make sure with the audience, you know. <laughs> <laughs> very <The> good. <laughs> um, I'm very familiar with these technologies, okay? And I want to speak honestly here. Um, I also, um, I'm close to Ninosa. Her laboratory, yes, it was, yes, the Busage, it was an Anunnaki or Anachim, Anach um, laboratory for genetic experiments. There were many laboratories, there were many different teams, the good guys and the bad uh, guys, which was the Enlil faction. Though, so there are many place, different places on earth who are laboratories. The Busage is a big one. Ninosal had her um, was involved with the good uh, positive side. She had her main laboratory on the Nibiru ship, in the Eden of the Nibiru ship. But uh, the Busej is effectively involved. It's a facility where scientists, Anarch scientists from the en Enki, sorry, Enki Ia faction, were working. It's, it's fit to their size, and um, so I can confirm that. Well, that's very, very helpful. Thank you. I'm just trying to pull up an image of Nin Hussad there. The only one that comes up is that. <laughs> she looks very beautiful. Um, what, what does she? What do they look like? I mean, how how tall are they in comparison to a human, the Anunnaki that you are brought before? Well, uh, the original body, uh, it's about. I'm going to speak in meters because uh, that's my metric system uh, to be sure. Uh, let's say. Two meters fifty, two meters fifty to three meters high, but mainly two meters fifty. Uh, usually, it's the the average normal size of the Dianachim. When they came to Earth, they they fit themselves into avatars to uh, be able to strive in the conditions on Earth of uh, you know atmospheric and etc. pressure, gravity. So most of the time, the avatars would be bigger, taller. So that's when we're talking about giants, but their their consciousness would be retrieved to the ship uh, where the the normal body was. Um, yeah. And historically, the difference between the giants and the titans, because there's this notion that preceding the giants there were titans, and um, arguably, you know, we've been given very compelling or shown compelling what would appear to be forensic, geological forensic evidences that even preceding the Titans were creatures that were so vast in this world that when they um, when they met their demise, they ended up calcifying or uh, uh, concretizing into mountain ranges. I mean, it becomes an extraordinary labyrinthine story, but what is your understanding of the giants, the Titans, and anything uh, bigger and bolder that existed before the, even the Titans? Well, the Earth had known creatures that are now either extinct or either went to inner Earth for protection. There were beings that were quite uh, giant, but also, um, you know, among the experiments that have been going on with the Anunnaki, with the Anachim, their, their real name, there were also experiments that involved giant hybrids. Well, hybrids, at what, when we say giant, imagine at the time a giant now would be these people two meter 50 high for instance at the time huma humans owner of earth they were smaller way smaller we could even now modern humans be giants for them you know what i mean so you have to consider this as well and there were different types of extraterrestrials coming to earth uh, along the ages that have but the um, the, Elo the um, not the elohim the the other ones. Well, there was a race of hybrid, giant hybrids as well um, that are still sometimes found on Earth, still alive in certain uh, places on Earth. Fantastic. Uh, Dan, your reflections. Oh, uh, well, 
I um, yeah, I, just extremely grateful to be able to exchange with uh, Jen Hannah Redion since uh, you know April of 2022. We've been having technological exchanges on understanding the science of crystals, which is something I got involved with you know back in the 1980s with Dr. Uh, Dr. Marcel Vogel. Um, the thing that's fascinating, what I'm learning is how um, how reality comes into manifestation and the different densities that are in this particular dimension that we're in and how they have uh, they have given a gift of of a tool to be able to access the um, singularity or the the uh, uh, some they're called the void where when consciousness interfaces with that it allows that to be imprinted into a higher level that see you have to understand the higher levels of manifestation create the lower levels not vice versa and with uh, let's say with with a crystal uh, you can see I have a little piece of tape marked. There's two angles that are cut on the crystal. Um, I'll show you on a presentation here real quick. So that's our Vogel 52 60 degree cut. Yeah, uh, it is, um, if you can see that. Is that being displayed? Oh, there we go. Um this was something that uh, we had to get special authorization from the high command of the Galactic Federation in order to share this because of a, a question that I asked. It, it turns out that if you cut the crystal in alignment with the hexagonal core of the lattice structure and you cut one termination at a 51.84 or 52 degree angle, same as the Great Pyramid and the same angle that quartz naturally terminates that it acts as a transponder in the matrix in other words it's a receptive quality while the other end is a 60 degree angle and the 60 degree angle is as seen in the flower of life where you see the tetrahedral fractal geometry every tetrahedron is 60 degrees and so this acts as a resonance into um into the holographic matrix and so you have these two different ratios that both create a, a, a spinning vortex that reflect upon each other. And Jen Han has uh, shown Elena that how this meets is if you take the angle of one and the angle of the other, it approximates the area of what's called the eye of the crystal. This is a vortex that's created that opens up a singularity. And when your consciousness is at a level of uh, gamma brain waves, which is uh, depicted, you know, when someone is in a loving, compassionate state, uh, you have what's wonderful about the structure of the matrix is that love allows the energies to transcend through the densities. And so when you're in that state and you link with your consciousness into the crystal, and that vortex is opened when you piezoelectrically stimulate it. In other words, a crystal, as everybody knows, when you squeeze a crystal, you get an electrical charge out of it. Or you put an electrical pulse on it, and it will physically vibrate. It works both ways. So when you stimulate the uh, lava structure, where I put my fingers in this area where the eye is, and I pulse my breath, the breath is connected with our consciousness to project thoughts. And so when you pulse your breath, as Marcel discovered and as Jen Han um, confirmed, uh, like, like a Kundalini type of fire of, like that through your nostrils, and project it and squeeze at the same time and sink, you can link into this uh, singularity that, can um, alter reality. So uh, my question there to both you and Elena, in respect to that, I get the pulsing of the breath, I get the, the, the compression of the crystal, but my question here is, 
what is the connection between the compression and the pressure that you put on the crystal and your own blood song, your own fractal uh, torsion scalar um, plasma field that's coming out of your blood song? Like if I am a if I have a particular cosmogenetic um, predisposition, does that give me an advantage over using a technology like this? That if I'm a a, low, a more low frequency uh, uh, iteration of of the human, Do you, does that make sense? Well, when you say low frequency, I I take the um, I, that could be termed a, a dissonant frequency. You know, as in Dr. Yes. Emoto's uh, work, right. you know, where dissonance can't take form into the crystallization of water. Um, yeah. If you, as Jen Hanna says, the dissonance cannot attune to an ordered state of geometrical resonance. In other words, the matrix is such that um, if you don't have, if you have an ill thought, uh, a dissonant thought, like say you, you hate somebody or something, <laughs> you want to do something bad, you know, the, the, the pattern is dissonant and it does not resonate with the matrix and it will not allow it to transcend the, the densities. Um, so, Elena, this is, this is the ultimate creation technology for us in our evolution that right now, because you can only, you have to be resonating at frequency X and above in order to be able to make use of it. Yes. Yes, totally. These uh, technologies work on, on basic creative, creative technology creation, technology works with uh, a certain level of equilibrium of balance and of resonance in the frequency otherwise it doesn't match the, the the mechanism you cannot so there's this 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 state of uh, resonance in frequency in your frequency field uh, is what allows you to pass through frequency shields, for instance. That's why in the Radu Cinema uh, series that you are mentioning, yeah. so the people who have the right resonant frequency can pass through frequency shield, not others who are still in a state of dissonance and anger and fright, fear, etc. You have also, um, so may, these technologies, we're talking about mentioning the Anahim technology, like such as in the Busage, it works with two, uh, two different things, uh, a DNA interface and consciousness interface. So to work these technologies, you need to have, you know, DNA emits a pulse, a frequency key, a frequency signature. So if you have the right percent percentage, minimum of percentage of a certain DNA corresponding, matching the DNA of the people who built these technologies in your bodies, uh, if you have that, uh, you can interface biologically and uh, start it, activate it. it the, the, the technology will recognize the, the DNA frequency and will switch on, but to be able to then work it use it you need a consciousness interface and a consciousness interface is something more difficult because it's a uh, consciousness uh, soul frequency that uh, matches that is part of the group of the souls who build these machines so you need to be an for instance uh, an anachim in an anach or an anachim incarnated in these avatars you may have uh, it may not be, uh, Anunnaki may not be your home planetary matrix from the start, but if you have lived at least one life among them, you kept the, the consciousness imprint, the frequency imprint of this DNA that once your avatar carried. So you, you record everything, your consciousness records everything, all the DNAs you've been inhabit, inhabiting. So it, it works. So you need DNA and consciousness match to get to use these technologies special markers fantastic jane the meek inherit the earth and we also get to play with uh, luke skywalker technologies in the <laughs> in the fifth dimensional sense i mean how exciting is that um talk to us about your reflections so far and unmute your mic unmute your microphone jane <laughs> I believe that a lot of this technology, Sasha, could be revamped and upped if we all got our male and female balance within our own bodies corrected. 
we've got too much male over here and not enough female over there. And I believe once we have that aligned within us, we'll be we'll we'll be able to reach this unified consciousness where this technology can be used much more efficiently. And we we have to come out of the dust of this academia, you know, the great forgetting. It's it's piling up and piling up, and we have to be able to remove ourselves with our consciousness from all the dregs and the mess that we've come out of in order to be in a fresh state of mind to evolve into this new era of technology that we're going into. So we need, we're coming into this age of remembrance or all knowing. And how do you get to all knowing? You align your soul, your heart, your sacral energies and you trust the cosmic wisdom to give you the information that you need for any situation. So you're not relying on all this academia, the books and the history books and all the lies. And so we're moving forward using our God-given first source design that we were given in the very, very beginning to move forward and to access our DNA as the original source code that we were given. And that's everything that we need to remember right now in order to make this transition and this move and to be able to be strong enough to help others come along with us and trust us. And in doing so, we will be removing fear. Our male side will give us the strength to move forward and our nurturing feminine side will give us the impetus we need and the determination to bring back the mother, the eternal mother energy into the realm so that we can create this harmony that we're looking for. I mean, presumably that's why, presumably that's why we were designed in the way that we are. And presumably that's why the cauldron of creation in this quadrant, at least of the, of the universe is one that is predicated on the laws of duality. I mean, everything is in, on the checkerboard, so to speak. And we have to harmonize. We ultimately, uh, all of expression, all incarnation forces us to uh, go into phase coherence with those dual aspects um, at every level. But we've got this um, kind of Tavistockian Fabianistic agenda, uh, as you and I speak to a great length, Jane, about um, scrambling the dialectic and turning little boys into little girls and making whatever you want uh, acceptable and normalizing perversion in that sense. Um, so it becomes a, a very, very kind of distressed time within which we can expect people to find that harmonium and that uh, equ equilibrium. Um, just speak to that momentarily. Well, I think it starts with discarding everything that we've been taught and going within to find our true selves because once we realize this complete transgender agenda is toward post-humanism, then we can turn around and revere the male and the female, the divine masculine and the divine feminine again and say no to all this. Just like Leonardo da Vinci, they said he cut up bodies in order to improve his great artistic abilities. No, he was under the Medicis, the, Med the medics. They were prying and poking in our bodies just as much as, as those caves. I'm, I'm so happy to know you were right, Sasha. They, they were working on us, on our DNA, and trying to fiddle and fart around with the human body to such a degree that we could never, ever remember who we really are. And this is the point in time of our lives. We've come millions of years to get to this place so I ask everybody to just try to remember who you really are and embrace the original source code within us and don't look around for answers. And you can't legislate love and tolerance. It's just a human thing. Is to, We're good people. We are the angelics. It's the soulless that have created this terrible, terrible world. And we are going to change it together. And that will take women becoming their authentic selves and rising up with men, the divine masculine, and together going forward mm. from this point, knowing that we were at one time perfect and we will go back to that. Very good. Um, Elena, 
um, pedestrian questions. I'm trying to look through comments coming through here, and there's thousands of them. Um, the connection between the Anunnaki and um, the reptilian Draco and Yahweh, Jehovah. Describe where those components fit into the Gestalt. The Anunnaki or Anakim are a compound on diff of different races and species. Among them, you have the Anunnaki who are of a human strand, that's generalization, and the, the Anunnaki who are of a reptilian strand. How does this fit is that the, the, the Anunnaki that came to Earth for the great expedition, the Kashkal, were half human, the, the um, Enki side, because Enki's um, mother was Anunnaki human, so he was human, and Enlil, his half-brother from the same father, Anu, had his mother uh, reptilian. The mother of Enlil was Sikar, uh, or Draco reptilian strand of genetics, a Sikar queen from Orion, Queen Tia. So Enlil was half-reptilian Sikar, and that's when the Sikar Draco reptilian come into mingling with the Anunnaki experiment because it's a long story, but the King Anu had to marry a Sikar queen for diplomatic reason in Orion and have a son and Lil who would rule over the empire, although the rightful heir was Enki or Ia. All these people arrived on earth and that's when um, Enlil, the, the reptilian Anunnaki one, wanted to enslave humanity as slave workers. And, and Ki said, no, these are amazing, amazing bodies and souls, and they have such a potential. I want to activate, I don't want to enslave them. So that's why they were arguing, there were wars, and there were two strands of genetics, two strands of genetic experimentation. Okay, And that's when the, 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 the famous royal uh, reptilian families of Earth come from, and they are and Anunnaki and Draco reptilian. That's where the confusion uh, are they this or that? No, they are both because they come from the, the Enlil stream uh, bloodline of Draco reptilian, Anunnaki reptilian bloodline. That's what they, they came uh, from. Yahweh was Enlil. There are archaeological uh, evidence. Uh, I'm actually preparing a, a video about that with Corinna Pataki. We've been through the archaeological uh, evidence and uh, the, the scriptures, Bible uh, evidence. Yahweh is Enlil, the bloodthirsty God. And there are two strands of royal bloodlines, the royal bloodlines of Enlil Anunnaki reptilian, the evil royal families. And there's another royal strand it's the royal bloodline of Enki, Ia, that gave the patriarch, Adam and Eve, the patriarchs, Yeshua, and uh, the activated uh, bloodlines. That's two different strands. I don't know if it answers your question, Sasha. Yeah, well, it, it's getting there. And again, I'm trying to just, um, I'm trying to put very straightforward, reductive questions to you because we're going to a big mainstream audience that's not even my own yeah. audience because we're syndicating here. So I'm interested again in those people sitting in their living room, listening to this insane conversation, a bunch of cracker jacks are having, <laughs> but are actually interested because they're sensing that it may be offering them some real enlightenment to get them out of their cult programmed entrapment. So what is the relationship between uh, Moses, who was the creature that Moses met on top of Mount Sinai? Haha, <laughs> uh, it wasn't a good one. Um, I think it was, I have all reasons to believe it was Enlil. Uh, this, this, this character was horrible when, you know, when the, the Moses and his people were saying to this God, we're starving, please give, give food to my people. And he would say, they rather receive fire if they complain, and they would send fire darts at them, things like that. He was a horrible, bloodthirsty tyrant, uh, Yahweh. He, he was really awful. He wanted virgins for himself. He said, sacrifice your kids, uh, give me all the virgins for myself. He, he, was, he, he was a horrible person. And when, when Yeshua came, he said, hey, uh, this guy, 
your father is not my father, he said to the, the priest of Yahweh. And that's why he he ended up not well. <laughs> okay. So was was Jehovah was Jehovah and Yahweh the same? No. Uh, oh, sorry. Yes. Yes. The same. Yes. The same. The same. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. what is the relationship between what we refer to as Anu and Ra? Anu is the, the emperor of the Anah Empire. Is the is a Ra. Ra means supreme ruler. Okay. And Anu as the emperor is the Atta Ra, the high supreme ruler of the empire. Ra means supreme ruler. It's a title. And uh, Marduk had this title of Ra as well on earth on earth right so moses in that sense was communicating with an angry jealous god and taking the dictate from an angry jealous god to become the framing the frameworking of that aspect of the judeo christic um history it was all framed within fear um terror um yes. and and subjugation yes to the dominion of this all powerful um, God that we had to worship and offer lambs and babes up for sacrifice to appease. Insane. It is. It was insane. It was insane. Yes. Yes. And pe people, you know, um, it, it's a shock for the Christians to realize this. I am not the only one to uh, bring this truth. You have uh, people like Moro Bellino or, you know, researchers and people who really know the, the, the text and the history and the real history, true history. But I have to say, it's not a big deal for the Christian. It seems to be. But in fact, um, what is Christianity? You have to say, to, to rethink it. Christianity is not an institution that will control you by fear and putting you on your knees. Christianity is all about love, about the connection with God, slash creator, slash source. The message of Yeshua, who came from the Enki good bloodline, uh, positive the patriarchs, the bloodline of Enki and Ninosa. Yeshua uh, was teaching love, compassion, he was an ascended master and he this is christianity this is christ consciousness what is right. christ, consciousness? christ consciousness it is the right. frequency of the christ genetics this bloodline this bloodline okay the the bloodline mm -hmm. of enki and it is a frequency that the, the genetic frequency of compassion that's christ consciousness and when the the, the prophecy said Christ, Christ will return. Jesus, it's not Jesus who will return. It's Christ consciousness. The frequency of the bloodline has returned into our solar system in 2021. It's Enki, the father of this bloodline. His frequency has blasted an activation of all the descendants. And there are millions of this bloodline because they have multiplied and multiplied on this planet. There are many. Right. So we've, we've come of age in that sense, and the resurrection of the angelic temple is assured through that civilizational al alchemy. Uh, another question coming through here. What's the distinction between what we refer to as Amen-Ra and Ra? Ra is a title, uh, and Amen um, was Marduk, in fact. Marduk was the, the god Amen, the hidden one. Uh, Imen means the hidden one. It was Marduk. That's uh, confirmed by uh, archaeology. And uh, it, it took the title of Ra, the, the supreme ruler, Amun. Ra was, uh, in ancient Egypt, a uh, title for the sun god, the supreme sun god. But then it was associated with all the other gods, you can you could have Horus, Horus Ra, uh, Amun Ra, um, Atum Ra. That means uh, they are supreme rulers. They are rulers, not supreme. Sorry, they are rulers. Mm. Uh, but so, it's so if if Moses was engaging with an angry, jealous God, who was Master Yeshua engaging with, and who was Prophet Mohammed, peace upon him? engaging with, interacting with? Yeshua would be involved with his real father of his bloodline, would be Ia or Enki. And, you know, the, the Zanunaki were playing, playing gods. Well, Enki never played God. 
he, he was always humble and compassionate. But Anlil and Marduk and Ninurta, so who are they? Uh, Ninurta is the biological firstborn of Enlil. He's reptilian, Ninurta, and uh, he is as bad-tempered as his father. Who is Marduk? Marduk was the son of Enki, beautiful uh, human uh, kid that Enlil, whom Enlil subverted to the dark side just to harm his father Enki and utilized Marduk against his father as a weapon, he weaponized him against his father. And Marduk was groomed by his uncle Enlil to become the most horrible person. Marduk become the, Marduk is Lucifer, okay? Uh, the fallen one, fallen in fallen in, in frequency, uh, not from the sky, that rebelled against his father Enki and led armies against his father. Uh, and, well, who was Enki? Uh, Marduk is Lucifer. And uh, that was the, the greatest wound of Enki to have his son turned into this, 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 this horrible thing that he became. Right. Okay. So um, is Enki and Lil apocryphally the story of Cain and Abel in simple terms? Uh, no, 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 because uh, I wouldn't say that uh, because Cain and Abel, it's also symbolizing the, the fight between two, two brothers, but they were descendants of Adam and Eve. So they were not at the top. They were not the original part of the original extraterrestrial um, um, founders of the, the, these bloodlines. Okay. And my last question to you, which is a real toughie, I think. Um, and Jane, you're going to enjoy this one. All of the conversations we're having about the Genesis point of the gods, the god kings, the progenitors of man, we refer to them all going back up to the Amun Ra, the Ra, the God, the, you know, the, the Jehovah, the Yahweh, and above. Um, where does the mother feature in any of this? Who or where do we identify the mother? that was also the progenitor of all of these elemental gods and god kings. You know the, the winners write history and um, they obliterate the mothers, the, the, the role of the Anunnaki women in all of this because uh, it became a patriarchal system. Well, um, Female and Anachim were as much involved in these genetic operations as the male Anachim. We're going to talk about the, the positive experiment of activation uh, of these, uh, these bloodlines, who are the, the, the experimentations led by Enki and his scientists. But he was working with uh, this lady, Nin Hursag, who was um, his cousin, actually. You know, in, in, in these languages, um, Sister, he, she was not his biological sister, she was his cousin, but sister means wife, can be mean sister, can mean cousin, so it's a generic term. She was it, she was his uh cousin and she was a geneticist, she was very, very, uh, very good. She she was the one who worked with him relentlessly to activate these first humans and saved his a, a bloodline of activated ones. They had many tries with uh, Adam and Eve, and they finally came up with the right male, Adapa. And then they wanted to create, activate the, 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 a female. But when they activated the female, uh, Nin Hosa put her of her genetics in the female. The, the, and the last female, the, the completion of this work was Hawa, Eve. Um, why did she give the deactivation to this female that this female would transmit the activation to the male? Because the female is a divine conduit of cre for creation. The, the female body, human female body, is um, a, a vortex that is able to welcome a fractal of 
consciousness from source directly. Females have the direct creative uh, conduit to source. So activating a female in all her capability is creating a being that is going to be walking vortex connecting directly to creator and everything she will touch, say, do will activate. And that's the the moment when Ninosa rep Ninosa represents is represented by the serpent. The serp what is the serpent? This double male female <laughs> inside coil that is our power our power core along the spine. But also the DNA, the double coil of the DNA that is present in all the cells. When these two things are activated, when the Kundalini, as we call it, activates, it activates the little one in all the cells, the DNA coils, and you became you you, you become a vortex, a walking vortex. So the serpent was Ninosa, and she gave the knowledge. But why the knowledge? Because when this is activated, the pineal gland blasts and you have direct connection with all the knowledge of the universe because you are human and you are a fractal of God. And to, to really help the Christians understand that the serpent has been demonized, the one, woman has been demonized, there's a reason for that. There's nothing more beautiful than a woman carrying a child in her body. All creatures, creators, created, are fractal of the creator. Everything in the universe that is sentient is a child of God. There is no aliens or demons, blah, blah. No, they are also children of God, just born on other worlds. We need now to... I'm addressing the Christians, broaden our vision and open our heart at the same width to encompass the understanding that all creation is children of the Creator. We're all fractals of Source, Creator. We are made at the image of God, not the bodies, guys, not the bodies, the soul, the soul. So that's what you. Um, I would say you need to know. Well, very, very, very beautifully put. Thank you very much for that. So we're winding down here, friends, to the end of the conversation. And um, you know, as I was listening to um, to Elena, there, it occurred to me that because I was also listening to the echo of my own question, which to me is a really important question. The theme that's been driving me for the last year and a half to two years has been this thing that I've been calling the resurrection of the eternal mother. And I'm having to investigate in my mind and my heart, what the fuck do I mean by that? Why is it a theme that's compelling me, compelling me to be the narrative that emerges behind all that I'm doing in community development, in technological innovation, in activism, in why is that a theme that I am sensing is the emergent core narrative to the emergent gestalt and i think i kind of got the answer in a bit of a meditation whilst elena was um explaining very beautifully um her thoughts on the matter the father the son the holy ghost the enkis the enlils these these angry jealous gods these prophets who've all got beards <laughs> All of that masculine, patriarchal, patrimonial, theatrical blah, blah, is all taking place under the aegis and with the backdrop of the mother who bears witness to the issue of all of that. So there you have it. It's the cauldron of creation, the void, the truest womb in that sense of creation, of ideation surely that's the living principle of the eternal mother which now we bring into threading the camel through the eye of the needle we bring that entire backdrop of creation of mythos of the fabric of reality we now bring it with our consciousness and we thread it into the living moment of our lives as we actualize and remember 
our divinity. So the mother, in that sense, has been the one that bore silent witness um, to all of that dialectic expansion, creation, theatrical hoo-ha. That's my takeaway on the on the theme here. Uh, your closing thoughts, Dan. Sorry. <laughs> Absolutely. I was trying to get a quote uh, from um, our dear off-planet scientist that goes right along with... Uh... Get, get, get the quote. Get the quote. I'll ask Jane to come in here and I'll come back to you. Get the quote. I want to hear it. Jane. Well, I have to ask Elena while she's here. I have to... Did I hear her say there's not going to be a soul of flash? Because my friends will kill me if I don't ask that question. <laughs> Well, the sun, the sun has, has flashes regularly, okay? There may be solar flashes because there are always solar flashes uh, on ongoing basis, but this is not something that is going to activate humanity. Uh, the activation process, activation of what? Of the realization of who you are, the, the suddenly blast of awareness of who you are this is a personal process for every each of you a personal process that you are going to undergo at your own pace privately personally with your luggage of wounds of traumas that you're going to need to heal and your, your personal journey and there's nothing global that is going to activate everyone at once. This, this doesn't work. This is not logical because we all have different levels of, of journeying in, in the, on that path. So um, there's, I think this solar flash is another psyop, not the solar flash in itself, sun has flashes all the time um, and, and cycles, but the psyop is what we put on, on a solar flash event that is going to do something about activation. That's to make people passive and not do the work. That's to me another uh, psyop. So I think that's a very interesting subject. Um, and I have to say, I, I foundationally disagree in some sense. Um, I'm certainly one who believes that where we, um, where we commandeer our own ideation, our own imagination, and we bring together a fellowship of men and women in a state of actualized consciousness and we situate that group plasma onto a date line or a cosmic event or in anything actually that that will help to consolidate a morphogenetic upshift it's my understanding that you're absolutely right that it's all about whether or not we have personally crossed that threshold and done the work and if we haven't then no amount of cosmic events is going to make a jot's worth of difference. I could not agree more with that. I love the way you say it. But for those people who have done the work and now recognize that it is the currency of the fellowship of, of men, so to speak, that is going to be taking us into how we steer the collective into that morphogenetic upshift, that to me is the importance of yeah. us saying, okay, well, look, we could choose any date or any event. And as long as we are all of us group plasma projecting, you know, and God, you know, if we ha had the uh, had the crystal technology so much the better, I mean, that would just take it to the quantum as far as I'm concerned. So to, to explain to people who are confused about uh, the dialectic here that we're discussing, um, we could choose almost any event or time and put our, our group attention there and manifest something. My argument about things like the upcoming eclipse is that it is a perfect cosmic totem for those who have done the work and who are genuinely, genuinely, through the empathic wave connected to the fellowship, we can use these events to um, come together and manifest some kind of morphogenetic upshift. Just momentarily speak to that, Elena, please. Yeah, Sasha, I totally agree with you on that. That the, what what we agree, it's it's hundred percent, is that nothing is doing it for us. We are doing it. So doing things collectively is even better for those who have passed a certain threshold to we, to manifest our reality. That's even better. The more we we do exercise of manifesting reality, our reality together, 
it, it's it's working it's working uh we dan willis uh, you remember dan we did this first meditation with the, the crystal of work of manifesting a creation of re our reality into a crystal we made a video there were i think seventy thousand people doing this at the same time and we spiked the schumann resonance i remember that do you remember that yes uh jen han said we're in interresonance with the planetary <laughs> so we're our bodies are uh, and the crystals that grow on this planet uh are in resonance with the planetary matrix and so we affected the uh the, the what they call the schumann resonance very good. We've got Dr. Alex Ling coming on to the next segment and a group of um, shamanic scientist minds uh, in order to discuss the hyperdimensional physics behind some of these cosmological events like the upcoming eclipse uh, on the April the 8th and how the ionosphere, uh, the, the fabric and the geometry of the ionosphere changes during an eclipse. That's just a hard forensic physical thing. When the electrons are kind of pulled or dilated further apart i mean there's it's not happenstance that we've got um nasa sending three rockets up during the eclipse and it's not happenstance that the superhadron collider in the yes. cern is also after years of being in the doldrums is activating on that day at that time during the four minutes 28.1 seconds of the totality of the eclipse so there's definitely a you know, this is a quanta or a vector that is being elected or selected for good or for ill, it seems to me. And I'm very studied in the pathology of those kind of uh, events, Babylonian sacrificial node points, and how they've been the utility of uh, Babylonian priesthoods and invisible masters in order to conduct a mass ritual sacrifice and so on on those datelines. So my concern has been, how do we now counterpoint those babylonian actions with a with right action with corrected morphogenetic plasma that's my interest in these things um not i don't have an interest in anything out there in and of itself but i think so long as we are still being the utility of these babylonian calendric uh, events and 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 uh, witchcraft uh, it, to me it makes sense that we can where we can we should be using those to create counterpoint energy. Dan, uh, give us the quote if you like and, and uh, your last reflections as well. Oh, while, while we were discussing the, uh, <laughs> the, the vitalness of the, of the two polarities, uh, you know, it just came to mind of the communications log with, uh, with Jen Han, we were discussing that regarding the, uh, the crystal technology. And he has all stress, you know, we, we, we can do this without the crystals, of course. Uh, we have this within us, but he says also, you know, why not use these <laughs> powerful tools? Because the, the crystal is um, resonant on all dimensions, uh, I'm sorry, all densities at the same time uh, because of its geometry, and, and so is water. And this is, this is what he said in the communication log to me regarding the... Um, the vitalness of the balance of the masculine and feminine. He said, uh, I will now tell you this. Remember well, my friend, void is equally as important as matter. Frill bridges void and matter. The unshapeable concepts that your mind senses through the frequency of an emotion that connects you with the essence of knowledge are as equally as important as the physical words you read on a solid support. Consciousness bridges concepts and words, unshapeable emotions and written symbols. One is vital to another, just like copper and silver wire, um, to the core of the universe, red and white, female blood, male sperm, degeneration and generation, death and life, void and matter, copper and silver, the two serpents. Human DNA is such a thing. The invisible strands are here although you cannot see them or measure them as necessity as the palpable ones the two serpents aren't two different types of atomic arrangements of matter no they are the alpha and the omega they are the void and matter they are created and uncreated yet existence and non-existence construction and deconstruction 
the electrodes of the universe that spark source. Source is dual in such ways. When you set the two serpents free to dance around the crystal, they create the very essence of source, frill. This is a reproduction of the great creation. This is powerful, my friend. It is unlimited. It is free. It is not only about crystals. It is about so much more. It is about everything. Once you understand this, you are free. I just thought I'd share that little excerpt yes. from this 150 some pages of uh, exchanges <laughs> in I relation was to that. That wasn't a quote; it was a thesis, but a very welcomed one. So thank you for that, Dan. I think that's wonderful. Uh, where can we find that? Uh, say again. Where can we find that in entirety? Oh, uh, MarcelVogel.org. It's a site I did in honor of his pioneering work, which we are, Elena and I are expanding upon the knowledge of crystals with this uh, wonderful Palladian scientist who's currently working doing terraforming operations on Mars after he uh, graduated from uh, a university in the Pleiades. Wow. Uh, well, you count me in on that because I'm really, really looking forward to helping to get the uh, Vogel, Crystal, uh, Elena, Danan, Dan Willis um, phenomenon out whenever you want to key that initiative out. I'm very excited. Just so you know, I've, I've already been um, speaking to some serious crystal scouts who, who um, know how to mine and get really good quality quartz. Uh, you need to, I want to connect them in with you but I don't know how many you wanted to manufacture of these. Is this an initiative that's going to go out around the world, or did you, did you want to contain this initiative to only a, a circle of a few? Well, Jen Han Aredion has shared in our long communications uh, two technologies that uh, is knowledge and wisdom from their world. One is how they uh, power their entire planet, and also is Elena uh, very accurately describes how they power their starships. Um, and But we're not using it for the electrical power generation as it's not safe on this plant yet to bring out that technology. But uh, it produces frill. And frill, when it goes into the body, it uh, removes disharmonics. And so it, it's, it's healing and innate. And the other technology that I shared previously allows you to alter the holographic structure of the... Uh, of reality, um, which, um, you know, not everybody uh, is into. And, you know, you can get, get a crystal. There is a crystal um, cutter they were working with. I, we have no financial interest in this whatsoever, but they're forming the crystals and according to the specification of uh, Jen Hanna Redion, and that's on marcelvogel.org, um, you know, for people who want to um, experiment with the crystal sciences. But uh, I'm mostly interested in the academic aspect of understanding, understanding the technology of their world, which is thousands of years ahead of our understanding. Indeed. Well, God bless you. And thank you, Dan. Thank you, Jane. Elena, I want to invite you. We're running 10 minutes over, but I really want to invite you just to have the last word, bring your beautiful uh, resonance in just for a moment. You know, to many people around the world, Elena, they, they do feel, I know because I travel constantly and I'm constantly gibbering and speaking to thousands of people. It's what I do. I've done it for so long. I, I've got a fairly good pulse um, on just the general pulse um, from Southeast Asia, Central South America. I'm attending congresses and summits and meeting indigenous leaders, meeting, you know, commoners and meeting leadership. There is a sense and it is a very, very profound sense that we are reaching the fulmination point, the culmination point. Um, and to those who are meek of heart, those who are humble and those who are standing in grace and standing in the flame of truth, as I would put it, um, I sense no fear whatsoever from them, even although reality is morphing into a shit show at every level. Um, there is no fear. There is a sense of serendipity these people are welcoming the shift point. They are welcoming whatever unfolds. It is divinely anointed and divinely appointed. That's how the angelic human is receiving the benediction of the shift of ages. Conversely, there are people who are absolutely in a state of constriction and fear 
abject fear, um, paranoia, and um, complete discombobulation. What is your takeaway? What 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 is what are your words of wisdom to a world in psycho civilizational spiritual conflict as we move clearly to an epochal point, an, a nexus point in 2024, 25? Something's happening. It's going to affect and impact all biological systems. It is the onset of um, our biological ascension, in my view. What are your words of wisdom to people looking into this broadcast today? The positive timeline, the timeline of this wonderful future, the, our birthright future as humans of Earth is already here. It has already been anchored. And um, recently, uh, in the last few months, it was, I think it was in January, there was a big council on Earth with the Galactic Federation and few um, representatives of inner Earth kingdoms to just make do a brainstorming and point about the evolution of the, the the humans and globally it was really obvious for everyone that humans have globally if you take the overall um, frequency measurement they have already they're already there there's been enough people on earth now to this point in time who have awakened to who they are and who are aware and they are already in projected in that future and it's enough the earth they are bringing all the other ones with them so it's it's absolutely beautiful to see this to see this this period of victory even if though the the, the shadow still has some grips on the earth but you know when you have a change a drastic change in someone's life or in history or for now change in timeline um, the timeline has been redirected and stable now. The old paradigm always fights it and resists. And when you had, had you are at the splitting point of the, the you, you you don't know, you don't realize it's confusing. But as you walk towards the, the this positive future and you leave the old paradigm behind, you see suddenly the difference. There are many humans on earth who are still in, in, a, in a frame of mind of, of fear, in the frequency of fear, of wound, of confusion, of despair, of suffering. You know, this is part of the human experience. These people have their own human experience, and these times are catalysts for this human experience. Either side, we need to acknowledge them, love them, plant seeds in their hearts, be there for them with love, but allow them to continue their journey, to achieve their journey with compassion, with our compassion. Maybe many of them will at one point um, wake up, click, but many of them won't. It's okay because it's a temporary incarnation. When they finish their time, they come back in a new avatar, in a new time, where this time, they will be aware, they will go, wow, they will, you know, so it's just respecting everyone's journey and it's okay. It's okay. We, we, will, we will be okay. We're already okay. It's fine. <laughs> well, there you have it. Uh, beautiful. Guys, thank you so much. Uh, Dan Willis, Jane Evershed, Elena Danan, thank you so very much for joining us on Lazarus today. Thank you. Thank you. Good stuff. Bye, Jane, darling. Speak to you later. Thank you. Very good, friends. Okie dokie. Um, moving on, um, just to give you the roster for today, we've got um, coming up Dateline Zero Total Eclipse um, Opportunity for Resurrection of the Angelic Template. Um, and after that, we've got the, uh, the mapping the history of time, indigenous cosmic wisdom with uh, Dave Emery, and after that, we've got Stellar Secrets and Sacred Rites. This is the Chalkways cosmic uh, legacy for those who wish to join Lazarus Symposium and see the whole thing in entirety. Uh, the next segment we're going to be playing as part of this um, live stream open source broadcast, so stay tuned. And this is really important stuff. This is a broadcast that we did last week. Um, I think it was the biggest broadcast that I've done 
uh, in my life, which is actually saying something because I've done some pretty big broadcasts. But last week's one went um, ballistic, viral, and we're talking really about um, about the April 8th event and the 40 days of atonement, repentance, Nineveh that follow leading up to 18th, 19th of May, and how that almost certainly signals um, a shift point with the reset, the great reset, uh, uh, um, General Flynn, um, who I'll be speaking to, I think, on uh, tomorrow, actually. I think I'm doing an interview with him on the AGN broadcast. Um, General Flynn is warned about a black swan event that's about to kick off. Um, everyone senses something. The cardinal in the Vatican, who I was engaging with recently, who's now on life support, um, was warning me directly or urging me to warn the world about what was coming up in summer this year, the dateline, uh, the, forgive me, that uh, the ground zero for disease X, so to speak, is being planned for the Paris Olympics, the swimming Olympics in Paris in summer. Um, so whether it is a um, geoseismic series of geoseismic cataclysmic events that are triggered through um, directed energy weapon systems or um, God knows what else, whether it's disease X um, being sparked into manifestation through triangulated electromagnetic frequency waves in different parts of the world or in Paris during the swimming Olympics, um, creating a diaspora event of 150 countries going back to their countries and spreading a man-made AI virus. So yes, there is a virus. It's an AI virus uh, a phenomenon, but viruses in and of themselves don't exist. It's a, it's a dialectic. It's a shit show. It's been very difficult for a lot of people to keep ahead of the this aspect of the truth movement. I get it. I'm seeing every day so much feedback. People going, I thought there wasn't a fucking virus, so why are you going on about viruses? Well, because there are AI manipulated phenomena, which we now refer to commonly as a virus because it's actually an exosomic response, but it's been artificially induced and it is in and of itself virulent. So therefore, we have manufactured the virus that didn't in and of itself pre-exist. So uh, Babylonian health is skelter again and how the laws of manifestation work. We allow ourselves to be cult programmed, uh, educated, you know, by a cult programming blood lusting machine for so long, we end up manifesting the thing that, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a shit show again. Um, but the broadcast coming up with Dr. Alex Ling and a handful of others, I think is a very important one. Pay close attention. I will say this, that on Tuesday, I'm doing another live broadcast with Dr. Alex Ling and some remarkable souls who are coming forward in order to do a final countdown to the April 8th total eclipse of the sun. And again, I will be here in this place. That is the navel of the earth. That is zona del silencio, the zone of silence, where no electromagnetic static occurs, no radio signals occur, no white noise, just absolute, absolute zero point stillness, silence, the navel of the paramagnetic earth. The total eclipse of the sun will be occurring in its fullest totality when it passes directly, directly overhead of the Zona del Silencio. 2,000 feet up, we will be there. We have guardians, shaman, scientists, our crew will be there. We will not have any electronic equipment with us. We will not be taking our Starlink with us because it wouldn't work anyway. But we will be planting the Aum, the hum of the angelic human will be heard in that still point in the navel of the earth as we receive the benediction of the eternal mother and the resurrection of the angelic template will be assured. So that's part of what we're discussing coming up, the 2024 solar eclipse. Okay, friends, 
Um, Christy, you can pretty much take it away. I'll just uh, bid adieu to the audience. Uh, I'm going to be here in the studio watching uh, through this. I might jump uh, in and out, but we've uh, set the rest of the stuff pre-record so we're not subject to any uh, further broadcasting interference. All right, friends, much love, and uh, thank you for joining me thus far. Well, well, friends, this conversation is about D-Day. This conversation is about the line in the sand. If we consider that the biggest uh, object in our uh, omniverse that we're cogent of, it is the sun, Ra. It is the bearer of life. It is the alpha and the omega point in that sense, as our great friend, the hyperdimensional Physicist Dan Winter reminds us nothing comes in or out of this uh, quadrant of the universe without coming through the sun. It is everything. So a solar eclipse in that sense also becomes something of paramount um, hyper energetic importance. It's something which affects uh, us on every level, especially uh, on the subtle body of this cosmos. And this great time of transition, this great time of revelation, tribulation and revelation is all about how we as sentient sons and daughters of God navigate that transition uh, between the veil, so to speak. So when we have a vast uh, photon band um, and, and we're moving into the compression point of that photon band, the great breath of Allah, the compassionate that issues from central sun. We're moving through that field uh, of, of hyperdimensional particulates, so to speak. And that's, in a sense, enlightening us from the inside out. That is, at the astrophysical level of the mechanics of physics is more or less what's taking place. Each of us experience that in very different ways and how we enter that tribulation individually, how we face 
the actualized capitalized self the relationship with atman with the divine within ourselves becomes the only question that is worth asking at this great time end of time time um very happy today to be introducing to the lazarus symposium um a very brilliant um thought uh, panel of thought leaders and starting off with uh, Dr. Alex King, originating from Germany, who's a highly regarded general practitioner championing holistic health care with an emphasis on lifestyle adjustments and spiritual practices. And his two decade long career in functional medicine is dedicated to promote uh, to promoting wellness and beyond his medical uh, pursuits. Dr. Ling is also an acclaimed stone sculptor. Uh, his passion for preservation uh, led him to establish a group focused on safeguarding Somerset's ancient water sources. He made a significant breakthrough in 2023, and he's planning to extend his pioneering research in Turkey, something I'm very keen to talk to him about, considering I have a great deal of experience in Turkey, been there about eight or nine times in the last year alone, and been in the deserts with Gobekli Tepe and Karahan Tepe and Mount Nemrut, and been to these great sites. I've gathered the stones and the rocks from them, brought them back, and we're also conducting some kind of analysis there. Very interesting part of the world. Also, uh, oh, forgive me, Alex, just say a brief hi so people can put a handsome face to the to the name. Oh, hi. <laughs> hello, hello. Yes, uh, very. I'm very, very glad to be here. Thank you for having me, Sasha. That's a great opportunity to talk about all the research which I've done over the last 40 years, pretty much. Beautiful. Thank you. Also, Dr. Joe Whitaker, a biomedical scientist, truth advocate, New Earth technology geek, holistic medicine preacher, Egyptian energy worker, coach, speaker, and co-creator of 5D Earth. Uh, more You can find more at uh, drjoewhitaker.com. Joe, very happy to have you with us today. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me here today. I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. Like you said, it's E-Day, <laughs> and I'm really uh, looking forward to speaking on that today. Good stuff. Thank you. Um, Medin Lebakan, I think I got that right. I'll find out in a moment. Based in Redcliffe, Queensland, um, uh, Medin is a spiritual teacher and energy worker with a diverse background. And as a radio host, author, singer, songwriter, and visual artist, she specializes in spirituality, creativity, and holistic wellness. And she co-founded Guardians of Sovereignty to support truth and freedom during uh, the pandemic and leads an online group for planetary energy healing. So Medin also runs the YouTube channel Arise Humanity to inspire unity and higher vibration. Good to meet you, Medin. Lovely to meet you. Thank you so much for having me here at 3 a.m. in the morning, mind you. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Well, one of us is going to fall off the twig before the others, that's for sure. We'll be keeping our eagle eyes on you. Um, AJ Roberts also uh, um, uh, completing the panel here, the host of the AJ Roberts Show, a podcast that explores personal development and performance optimization, offering unique insights derived from his military experiences. And you can visit um, mrajroberts.com for more information. AJ, very happy to introduce you to the Lazarus Symposium. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, I love how this has all come about in very quick fashion, just like uh, we seem to be connecting with all the right people at the right time. Uh, so I had a great conversation with Alex the other day and uh, I just so happened to be in Portugal on the, the, the night of the eclipse and I was going to plan something for it and next thing it's just bosh 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 text message after text message i know alec you need to speak to alex you need to speak to joe and here i am and i love how this works <laughs> very good and that that beautiful thalonic blue background where are you situated uh i'm actually in my office but i record uh my my latest podcast so i've uh done a bit of a blue background it's very much the colors of my business and and well me i'm very blue but whereabouts is that that's the question Salisbury, but I, I can literally see Boscombe Down and uh, Stonehenge, a stone throw from me. Good heavens. Wow, wow, wow. Beautiful stuff. Um, mm. Okay, so folks, by way of introduction, today we are delving into the fascinating world of cosmic events, focusing on the only event that really, really matters, which is that, well, the Micronova event would probably matter substantially, but a total solar eclipse occurring on April 8th. 2024. And this esteemed panel is going to provide the unique insights into how this event signifies a pivotal nexus point in the history of human 
consciousness. Wow, we make some big sensationist claims on the Lazarus Symposium, but I'm going to repeat that one. Um, this event signifies on the 8th of April, 2024, signifies the pivotal nexus point in the history of human consciousness. And we're going to explore in this conversation the ancient connections between Megiddo, Turkey, and Mexico's zone of silence and uncover the hidden sound that serves as the blueprint of creation and learn about the HUM project, H-U-M. Alex, kick us off. Could you shed light on the significance of this particular eclipse and its influence on low frequency atmospherics? Um, I know there's a 30-minute um, uh, intro that you've got. If you wish, take it away from here. Okay, yes. Uh, I'm starting, first of all, with uh, the ancient connection, which uh, I'm, I'm going all the way to uh, Megiddo, which is in the ancient lands of Levant, which is just uh, situated at the uh, borders of Israel. Now, we all know that Israel always has been quite a conflict-ridden zone, uh, so especially now with all the conflicts going on, and this has been going on for many, many uh, thousands of years. So the reason for that is that uh, Megiddo is actually a mount and situated uh, in the middle um, of a plain, which is quite an important uh, lineage or line between Turkey, uh, the Arab countries, and Turkey and the European, uh, the European connection. So, um, because of this, the trades would have passed through the uh, area of Megiddo and uh, hence it was heavily controlled by, uh, uh, by numerous kings um, who wanted to have, of course, the, uh, uh, the, the upper hand in, in uh, all the trades which were going on in that time. So more importantly is that there is actually a spring um, which is connected in the uh, center pretty much the center of the Megiddo, the Mount of Megiddo, going down quite deeply into cave system. And this spring has been ever since, uh, for thousands of years, quite an important uh, point for frequencies. So I have to go back to um, one of the uh, Sumerian or Anunnaki kind of links, which would have sacrificial, um, would, would use this kind of point for sacrificial reasons to enhance their frequencies and keep control in that respect. So uh, there were blood sacrificials always uh, um, performed in, in that area, uh, going into the water. And this water is also connected to all the uh, different places going down into Turkey, like Gobekli Tepe and other, other tepes. There are about 13 of them which have been uh, barely touched and, and been excavated so far. But um, yes, very, very important energetically for humanity, because this was a point where uh, people got controlled quite often or, or have been controlled and enslaved uh, ever since. So they, they would basically have the uh, uh, using the, the energies of Megiddo, which also translated means and stands for Armageddon. Um, and uh, uh, and they also would be using these kind of specific places uh, in in some of the uh, uh, most known uh, solar solar events or, or astrological events more like. Now, let me just quickly explain why this is so important. The eclipse that we all unite. Um, and forgive me when I'm going back and forwards a little bit. So. There is an ancient text which has been uh, kept by the Rockefeller family and have been stolen actually from, from uh, these ancient sites and has been withheld for many, many years. So my father, who also was connected to the Freemasons, um, who also had uh, numerous texts and information on this uh, specific uh, subject, he would fill me in about 40 years ago um, about the, uh, the importance of the eclipse. And this is really what it is all about. They would, in ancient times, and it's going back like 14, 15,000 and a lot longer, 
they would choose substitute kings and put fake king into into position of, of the king to protect their uh, their person because in that time of the eclipse something quite extraordinary happens um, the frequency is changing due to the ionosphere changing and reducing the ions in the atmosphere so that means roughly that um, anything which has been created by the Anunnaki or the kind of because they were magicians so we shouldn't forget that they were using different technology at the time which was far more advanced than ours today and they had an, 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 a direct kind of impact on how to manipulate people so in that time when the eclipse would occur their shield would literally, literally go down to almost zero that would mean that humans could connect on a conscious level and create or connect to the field or to the to the uh, 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 matrix if i call it uh, from from our earth so this is like the original kind of frequency we are all connected to we all are creators it's just due to the controllers who then put an artificial matrix in place if you like this is what's being redesigned today with 5g and all sorts of uh, wi-fi related technology because they're short they're short waves so and they're being uh, basically uh, 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 um, amplified through the uh, through the ion sphere ionosphere so in this moment when the eclipse occurs this kind of shield goes down we as humans can connect to each other on a far greater level as ever before now in this point when it happens now with the uh, oh i forgot to say uh, so they would put the um, uh, the fake king into position to save himself and then afterwards after the event because they were worried that they would get overruled and that was the main point of their fear so and then after the event they would kill and sacrifice uh, the, uh, the the people who would take their position and they would rule ever since would, would continue ruling um, as as before so that is in short like the story of the history and the connection to the controllers and the Anunnaki and Sumerians and Babylonians. So they would continue this kind of uh, story ever since. The Haranians, for example, which were a group which was situated in Turkey near Orfa, Haran, that's one of their, 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 their cities which is still known in connection to the Haranians. They were extremely peaceful people, probably or possibly one of the last civilization which was in uh, connection with the true uh, frequency which connects us to this planet. What age, uh, what era are you talking about there, uh, historically? Okay, historically, the Haranians, there would be around uh, about 7000 BC. But there are some records, and that's I've been just lately been on the phone to, to so many people, uh, including some archaeologists from the area of Ulfa, who would say, look, there are more there's more and more evidence actually coming uh, coming about uh, uh, which connects actually the Iranian people to the first tepes so it looks like that they were the original builders of the tepes so mm -hmm. Karahan Tepe, Gobekli Tepe you know so these kind of and um, also there is of course talking from Gobekli Tepe Pillar 43, as you probably know yourself quite well, which is a phoenix, so I believe, um, holding a sphere, which is symbolizing the sun. So that in itself is quite an important clue. Now, we have used science to kind of reconstruct uh, two major events which happened, which was uh, just about 5,000, 6,000 years ago, and the other event is around 13,000 years ago. In both incidents, we have put proof that through Norwegian scientists who would have actually evidence within fossilized trees, and they could see that around this time, the um, carbon, the, there was a huge spike in carbon production on this planet, a very sudden carbon production. So also simultaneously, it 
fits in with so many, so much information connected together with the Tepe, like Pillar 43, talking from an event which represents the solar eclipse. And not only that, it's the solar maximum, which is one of the other clues. So if you have a solar eclipse and the solar maximum going hand in hand, the shield, the ionosphere, is really on its lowest point. Now, this event doesn't happen very often. So we're talking like thousands and thousands of years in between. And this is one of those events. This is exactly what is going to happen in Mexico on the 8th of April, 2024. So this is exactly why this is so important. It's so, absolutely fascinating. So 8th of April, 2024, and the last time something similar occurred was when? The last time was around 5,000 years, however, 6,000 6, years. So, but uh, it was, it didn't have such an event like the ice melt, for example, that happened in around 13,000 years ago. Uh, so that's when really something quite extraordinary happened. Uh, I'm not saying that there is like a, a, a catastrophic event happening. This is about consciousness. And we as humans have a, a, an incredible opportunity to claim back our freedom. And not only that, we are all creators. And this is what the information which they're trying to, um, to hide from us for such a long time and, and, and control us through fear and, and, and their kind of uh, creations, if you like. So we've been enslaved for such a long time. We don't know even what, it's, what it feels like to be creators anymore. So, but we all... In the simplest terms, what I'm hearing from you is that this, um, this gateway um, or this crossroad of the 8th of April 2024 coming up in a matter of days um, is um, essentially the, the, the access point for the benediction, for the grace of God, for us to be able to uh, recalibrate the, the yeah. full genesis of our species, of our, of our age, yes? It's exactly so absolutely spot on yes uh, what then what then is the technology that we should be deploying i'm talking about the biotechnology the intellectual spiritual technology what is okay. it that we ought to be doing in preparedness okay um very very simple we are already kind of equipped with one of the biggest tools which we can use to connect to each other as well and that is a primordial sound which comes actually from the universe. And uh, just of late in 2023, uh, they have recorded that sound as well. So which came from uh, the gravitational waves. And it's a sound which translates into a note, which is um, the C4 note. Um, now there are different harmonics. So we are working at the moment to give a guideline to people exactly not exactly the song because everybody has different harmonics so that's fine but just to give you a rough idea of which kind of hum you're going to use and there i said it already it's a hum it's a sound which comes out of the universe connects with all the waters around our world in the ocean it connects to everything and every everybody who who's uh, having containing water we are bodies of, of water as well we are vessels walking vessels of water and uh, Water has an incredible memory, and that is the other thing. So our ancestors knew about it, so they would call the water the cosmic ocean. And that kind of water has the blueprint of creation, and it is in, in every single person on this planet. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so uh, let me move on. Dr. Joe, um, help us understand, if you will, further the link between uh, solar eclipses and, and ancient sites. So um, when I first met Alex, <laughs> this is very much his area, but I'd also been on my own journey. And what, what I really want to explain to people is that the water, the cosmic water, as Alex is explaining, and the imprint and the information is contained and held in these um, structures for us to get access to. Now we, in our bodies as they are, 
it, we can be susceptible to frequencies and information that are out there. And this is where the, the grid is. And there's been various grids over, uh, over many different uh, civilizations. At the moment, we have the 5G grid, um, but there are other grids. And our bodies contain water. And at the moment, many people's, the water in many people's body is not structured, it's not crystalline. And therefore, these frequencies pass through people and they have um thoughts feelings sensations in this 5d world that come from this grid whereas when you look at the, the the ancient structures and the structured water that they contain because even like stones contain structured water they're able to hold that information and hold those frequencies and so what i very much advocate for people is one of you were just talking about what we can do with our uh, bio you know with our bio force our you know with our cells our biology the more structured the water is within our body, the more crystalline it is, the more we are able to hold the frequencies that will help us. And those are the frequencies then we can connect to, or just like Alex was saying, on the earth, where those where the frequencies which contain information uh, for us to be able to sense and understand, a bit like a two-way, I explain it like a radio station, but like a two-way radio station. We can download and upload information to these frequencies. And if we treat our bodies as such and, and, and make them structured and the water structured, we are much better able to do that. Very good. Yeah. Capacitance and charge, right, at, at that level. And that's really what it's all about, the structure and the geometry. Of, and this is where consciousness comes in, um, because actualized consciousness and connection to Atman is the is the perfected way of entering still point. Still point is what reestablishes the corrected geometry. So when we still the still the heart, still the mind, and that's the point of samadhi. That's the point of uh, that's the point of yoga. That's the point of um, meditation and of prayerfulness. Is really to reach that point of serendipity within the consciousness that actualizes into the psionic center, flames the human heart, the actualized human heart, which creates an empathic wave form, the opposite of the millimeter wave, right? The empathic wave is the one that reaches into the quantum and can traverse the entire known universe. And that's the power of the angelic human and the resurrection of the angelic human is that we can literally transform, transmute, transmogrify the whole of the field of reality once we engage that collective uh, upshift. So I love what you're saying there, Joe. It corresponds absolutely with, uh, with the mathematics of what we've been exploring in the Lazarus Symposium up until this point. So how did these celestial events alter radio signals and in turn our perceived energetic uh, frequencies, Joe? Um, so the, the, uh, as Alice was saying, because the ion sphere is being controlled and because of its structure currently, um, it, you can imagine it's like a net, an, a net of information out there. And a lot of people tune into it. And when we have these um, psychological events on the earth, you know, these nets are very powerful in being able to transmit that, that information. And for those people only able to access those frequencies because of their consciousness and because of their bodies and the frequencies, this is why they're much more susceptible to um, to these controlling mechanisms because they feel and think things, but they're not actually their own thoughts. Our brains don't have thoughts. We read information from from the structure of water and it's embedded in our dna and so when this structure as alice was explaining when this structure is no longer there we're going to be free of that control that information being constantly fed to us and this then gives us a massive opportunity to connect to those frequencies which has information which will unlock things in us and connect things in us and although we have that time, which is very powerful, it's very important to say it's going to go on for a period of time. So once we start making these connections, we're going to create our own net. We're going to create to the to the to the to the earth, to the earth frequencies and that matrix rather the, the true matrix rather than this um, one that's one that's up there. And once we make that connection, once we switch that radio station and realize we don't have to be stuck on one channel, there are other inf informations. It's going to help us and get there all the time very good so we're talking about the, the the difference the distinction between the false light matrix in that sense and the imminent flame the divine blueprint and there is a kind of convergence point now 
where the imminent flame, which is the Akashic, which is the, the, the mind of God, so to speak, is now through revelation pushing through into the manifest field. That's where this transition between so-called 3D and so-called 5D is taking place. But it's a resurrection of the immanent, meaning to say that which self exists. So the, the mind of God is there. The Akashic field is there. It was always there. It never left us. It's like the angelic template never left us. It's always that which self reveals, self fulfills, self exists within the false light matrix. We get pulled into the false light matrix. And to some great extent, we can begin to believe in the bad dreaming and the false light of that. And that takes us even incarnationally, cyclically, civilizationally, galactically into these cycles of time. And then eventually we remember through coherence. And uh, as um, um, Alex was just saying, the, the waters connecting us become, in a sense, the integral medium here, because every cell in that sense is an ocean and the ocean is the limitless abyss the cauldron of creation it's all a fractal uh, language this is very beautiful and uh, could you just finally share joe the insight again on the role of sound and water in harmonizing with these shifting frequencies just break it down one more time before we move on so we have the opportunity with this event with without the noise of the other frequencies being available we have now the opportunity to connect to each other awaken in each other um, amplify within each other these frequencies and as alice was explaining you know the hum frequency is one that's going to be able to carry and connect us because we're going to amplify that sound and that frequency which is already there and already within us and you know when you amplify sound then the effects become very dramatic and that's going to awaken and change and change things so my advice to people is please look into structuring water it is going to help you hold your frequency and it's going to help you receive and be able to resonate at those frequencies um, and and then we we together at a time we all use this hum this opportunity and do this hum because our impact is going to be greater which will hopefully reduce the amount of time it then takes us to you know get out of the situation that we're coming in the balance is already tipped let let's make it go faster beautiful and just to underscore what joe uh, is saying there um, a number of years ago, I can't remember, it was 15, 16, 17 years ago, I think more or less round about then, might have been a bit before that. This is a, a story that was well documented and well attested. And many years ago, with, within my foundation, Humanity, we studied this event um, because of the nature of or the power of structuring water through thought. What the story is, is that there was a war council called in the Pentagon and they had a room set aside for that. And the, the usual um, uh, dogs of war and the jackals came in, the brass came in for a, for a powwow, for a meeting, which was a, an absolute abrogation and derogation of human rights. And they were planning a, a very ghastly assault. I don't know if it was Afghanistan or against Iraq or Iran, but it was a massacre that was being planned. And it was dark. And there were military brass around that table in that room in the Pentagon. Um, and uh, at the end of the meeting, um, all of them, but one or two people were violently ill, became violently ill. So there was a national, there was a big scandal, a security scandal. What the hell happened? Was something put in through the air conditioning? You know, was there, <clears throat> was this a terrorist attack? <clears throat> it turns out <clears throat> that the uh, only thing that had been in the room outside of the the um, clerks or whoever right taking the notes <clears throat> and the military brass was water was jugs of water and water and as they had been deliberating on this act of evil for two or three hours intensive concentration in this kind of closed faraday cage type room not impermeable to the outside world the water restructured accordingly and poisoned the shit out of them um, that was a phenomenon, again, well-documented, well-attested, and that, I think, illustrates 
the power of consciousness over water. And when, when people talk in terms of structurizing the water that you're drinking before you drink it every single time, right there, you probably got the greatest doctor you'll ever meet in your life. So let's move on um, to uh, Medin. Kindly, Medin, share your thoughts, um, A, on what's just been discussed here, but on the spiritual evolution that may be sparked by cosmic events like this upcoming eclipse. And can you explain how the human unity movement is working to raise awareness about these potential effects? Sure. Well, thank you for the opportunity. So I, I guess extending the uh, discussion that's been going already is the fact that we are such important co-creational, you know, infinite beings that work with energy. And um, I'm an energy worker, so this is an area that I'm very interested in. And um, when we work with energy, we can create incredible shifts. So when the uh, Second World War happened, they said, claim that if 2,000 people had meditated together for peace during World War II, it could have ended the war. And I just want to share just a couple of examples of how we can work with energy and make a huge difference to the collective. So on the island uh, where I lived for 18 months, there was a tragic house fire where multiple family members uh, died. And uh, the next day on the island, there was uh, this really palpable energy of grief. So I measured the energy on the island after that, and it was uh, 75, which is the um, frequency of grief on the Hawkins scale of consciousness. So then I uh, coordinated a group, uh, not only in Australia, but some global people as well, to do a healing on the island. And uh, we did this uh, synchronized uh, healing. And then we measured the outcome of that. And <clears throat> it very quickly shifted to 200 courage in the Hawkins scale of consciousness, which was a huge jump. And a further confirmation about that was that there was uh, many people that commented on the shift in the energy, there were uh, people saying that they had felt an intense sadness in their heart. And then um, it shifted at the exact time that we did the this, this energetic healing. So it is so incredibly powerful. And then another time I organized a, um, with some help of many wonderful people, a symposium where we worked with specifically water and there were over 5,000 people who uh, attended and we worked with scalar energy and these uh, machines called SCIO machines, which are global um, machines that can work with quantum biofeedback technology. And the protect practitioners were in charge of these and they worked with these on water. And, and on humanity. And the scalar energy was also working as well as the 5,000 people involved. And right at that moment on the Schumann uh, resonance, there was a cross right at that moment when, when they worked uh, collectively. So, you know, it doesn't take a lot of people to make a huge difference. And when we combine that energy with water, it's phenomenal, you know, what we can achieve. Uh, so, I know that the dark are particularly not wanting humanity to unite at the moment. So hum for humanity, and interesting that hum is in the word humanity as well, is a project where we can harness uh, the power of sound. And leading on from what Joe was saying too, some wonderful words about the power of sound are the arrangement of atoms has a secret melody. Harmonics are keys that unlock DNA codes, blast vortices into your mind and expel all darkness. Sound is the tool of creation. It is what comes first in the greater scheme of all things. So the first thing is sound. Sound exists before anything else. Sound creates matter, energy and consciousness. So another thing that you could do is harness a color with sound, bring the two together. The frequency of C4 is actually a darker shade of red if you look at the color so you can combine the color visualizing the color bringing the color in with the sound and those two combined really magnifies the impact of your energetic work uh so yeah there's just some um the importance really of of that and 30 million people too around the 
um, planet will be physically experiencing the solar eclipse in uh, Mexico, United States and Canada uh, simultaneously. So they're getting that physical impact as well um, where, you know, it actually becomes dark and this and the sun is blocked out. And so that will be com sort of compacting everything that's happening as well. Beautiful. So that's really the event, that event horizon. You're looking to aggregate as many people in, in a kind of singularity act of, of collective consciousness uh, to take a best advantage of this extraordinary passage that we're moving through. Now, there's not much time. It's March the 9th. So we're really, we're really talking about um, 30 days from now, right? Correct. And it's like when you when you visualize the metaphor of a surfer, you know, there's a wave coming in. It's a huge wave. Do you turn around and walk back to shore and, you know, ignore it? <laughs> or do you catch the wave? You know, so we want to all catch that wave as it comes in, because it's just such a uh, incredible opportunity for humanity. Uh, and people feel this intuitively, they, they're feeling this energy, they're feeling something coming. And this is an opportunity for us all to collectively utilize the energy, this gift that's been given to us to uh, change the world uh, in the way that we're all so, um, you know, we're so committed, so many people are so committed to making this change. And this is uh, our opportunity, I think. Beautifully stated, and of course, you're absolutely right. I mean, there is such a huge, um, such a huge upswing in, I don't know, the milk of human kindness and common decency and sweetness. And for me, that's the the elixir that's emerging through this fucked up four years of of um, covidiacy, this insane tribulation of the Saturnian Babylonian priesthoods as they all collapsed into this cacophony and it's not over i mean we're still in the shit show right now and and you know this kind of orchestration of the collapse of the grid and the global economy and all of that there's still forces that are seeking to um to bring about maximum um calamity you know uh, but mm -hmm. that's being offset by what you're talking about by this emergence this common sweetness and the you 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 embody it you know your 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 tone and the way you speak and the fact that you're uh awake at uh 3 51 in the morning <laughs> in this conversation no but that's the that's the the you know that's what i'm talking about you know this is the sweetness this is the meekness that is actually uh, well we all know the meek inherit the earth right and, and that that's the thing and i'm loving it aj um could you just take us further into this um conversation by explaining the movement towards unity and heightened consciousness as you see it and how best we can we master um the uh, the fellowship of man at this time yeah absolutely um so for the benefit of the people viewing this have never seen seen me or heard of me um my name is aj i'm a former british soldier of 15 years served in iraq afghanistan sierra leone uh they later went on to work at port and down as a consultant where they do a lot of uh testing um and subsequently quite near where i live um but from then uh, i kind of went solo as soon as the uh the covid madness started and um basically started with using my podcast interviewing people doctors everyday normal people that were in the thick of it all around the world um brought about all their stories and all their, their reports of what was actually happening now was be able to create a wider picture of what was really happening around the world for people um outside the mainstream um, and then that subsequently led me to doing talks around the country and then using those opportunities to bring people together um, who were seeing past all the BS and as the, everyone's consciousness is raising to do exactly that, to raise consciousness en masse uh, of as many people as possible through uh, my online courses, my talks, my healing events, which we're now doing, which involves sound and breath um, to keep keep raising that consciousness en masse. And, um, the great thing it does, like you said, is that unity. It brings everybody together uh, in large numbers, and they don't really want to be anywhere else. So like every course I've run, for example, they all like the best of friends now, and they're all talking to each other as soul brothers, soul sisters, and how are you feeling today, checking in on each other. They're very much getting into uh, all the metaphysics side of stuff, how we evolve, how we're you know constantly growing. Um, so I'm seeing that on a daily basis and uh and within the wider collective seeing that like just the everyday people's uh, awakenings happen as well 
um, from my family and friendship circles to uh, all the people that I kind of work with their their circles as well. So you know, from a uh, a unity side of things, we're we're seeing a mass shift in consciousness, like towards what people are actually seeing and accepting the world. Um, like millions more are now very acceptance of what COVID was. Uh, it's kind of like almost been like an overnight shift. It's just the sheer amount, really. Uh, and it's and, and for, for a lot of people, it's a liberation, as we know. Um, and we've always been there to help them with this whole point of things like this. So yeah, in in essence, it's imperative that now that everyone does come together they see that there is no cause for divide anywhere and those divisions have literally been implemented through you know the controllers through these false matrices uh, and people are seeing all these systems collapse as well um you know especially here in here in the uk which is as you know is such powerful land um people are understanding that they've kept this land so dense on purpose because of just oh, yeah. how powerful it is you know they kept the male generation just hooked on football beer and uh arguing and shutting them off completely you know to on purpose it's there to be seen yeah. um and i think uh as more and more people awaken more and more um high or more evolvedly awakened people are getting around the country they're doing the work they're you know they're doing that light work doing that grid work um on a on a huge huge scale um so yeah it's, it's exciting very very exciting and it just so happened that i'm going to be in portugal on the 8th of april uh running a, a plant medicine retreat in the hinterland and the algarve on the 4th of april um and i couldn't get a flight back on the 8th so i was like okay i'm obviously that's supposed to be there for a reason then next thing it was oh there's an eclipse then and this is happening and this happened so, oh we'll get a meditation going online and then uh mutual friends of ours is, we said you need to get on a call with alex you need to get on a call with joe and uh and here we are so yeah utilizing my channels and large network you know bringing multiple people from around the world you follow all my stuff it's an absolute no brainer that whilst I'm on that very powerful land in Portugal at that time, um, and with some of the people that will be with the retreat as well, um, it's going to be a great opportunity to, you know, add to the, the amazing event. And, Beautiful. and, and, and Joe, uh, uh, and you guys are all planning. Beautiful. That, very good. So that that's going to be an online, online event. Let's discuss more about how that's going to play. Um, I'll see if I can also plug in, uh, from my studio here in Mexico and um, help to galvanize uh, more attention. I should be able to do that. So I'm in, I'm in Mexico at that time. You're where my family all live in the Algarve in, in Portugal. If you need a if you need a place to to stay, let me know if you have a hard time finding something. All right. Very good. Looking forward to that. I want to ask another question of you, AJ, um, just connected to your um, military um, background, your story. I also grew up in a war. I grew up b behind grenade screens and dodging bullets for the first 15 years of my life in, in Africa and in sub-Saharan Africa. But I'm, I'm curious to know what your sense is of that, those times when you're kind of bunkered down with your brothers and there's a sense of unity and fellowship there. Actually, it's a really close bond because you are reliant uh, your life can be reliant on that bond in that situation. Yeah. So it, it it forces a compression of, of unity and fellowship, and it's a real strong, strong, palpable bond. To some extent, football teams have the same bullshit, but, you know, it's very different in a military situation, especially when you're in active service. And I'm curious to know your thoughts about how, because that's a very artificial scenario where you're in a military, you've signed the fucking contract to be in the military, and it's all part of the devil's plan, that stuff, whether you like it or not. Mm. And, you know, and yet that bond, that beautiful fellowship is intact and it's pristine. I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on riffing on the distinction between that kind of fellowship and the kind of fellowship that you are now orchestrating in a in a very kind of spiritualized way speak about the distinction between then and now yeah i mean well first of all in the military there's uh that they literally pull any form of spirituality out of everything so you know we talk about like spirit mind body you literally go join the army it's just mind and body and you're given a load of equipment and kit and you know supposed to carry out your orders um so it's, you know i've very rarely met anybody that was even really religious other than commonwealth soldiers so no one even practiced like really prayer or definitely not meditation um 
so but but at the same time you have that camaraderie and that bonds and I, I never met anybody that said yeah I joined the the military for for queen and country um it was always there was always a reason I'd like to make a difference or to be of service and I, it's actually those energies that I think that myself and other veterans that are doing great work take um into what we're doing now so uh, I'm a big believer in that you know, as I know you guys are you know every single thing that's happened to, to us to this point is literally like our basic training for now so yeah. I needed to have those 15 years uh, you know in all those different places around the world and those different experiences you know I've seen the best and the absolute worst in humanity um, but at the same time I've had to gain all that experience to be able to stomach certain things to do the role I do now which is then bringing people together on mass but more from a a spiritual sense understanding who they are and how powerful they are rather than in the army you just you only look within the, the you know the the realms of your 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 barracks and the orders that you're given so um prime example my f- previous comrades were the ones i argued with the most in 2020 and 2021 because they were so heavily programmed into the system um whereas i was very much unplugged from the system uh that, that there was a lot of uh you know disparity there between us but yeah, the, in terms of the the camaraderie, it's um it's what I very much embody and install into the communities and the groups that I kind of mix and share with, not in a, a shouty way like uh, like you do kind of in the military, but uh, it's very much that constantly forming a bond because as soon as you do that, you lay the foundations. Just like in the military, if you've got a strong foundations, that strong bond before you even advance to battle or whatever the operation is. You know, you've already got those strong foundations there before you've even, you know, you've got there. And it's, it's it's important to take those same skills and attributes into, you know, what we're doing now. And for people to feel that because, you know, we've we've experienced this division in every walk of life. You know, there's just countless amounts of divisional tactics being used. Uh, and people are starting to really embody and feel the, like, feel the, feel the empowerment of, like, of unity and community now like they've never experienced it before. I think um, a lot of people similar ages to us um, remember those times with grandparents and all the wider family around the dinner table on Sundays with no mobile phones and all this kind of stuff. And that's all just been completely washed away as well. And everyone yeah. lives day to day on social media, don't they? Oh, you know, AJ's out with his family. Like, um, so th- that's people's, that's become the sort of the norm. So I think now, uh, with the help of, with the help of the, the scandemic and what it's done, it's brought people together in that sense of a need for community like never before. Mm, beautiful, Alex. Um, didn't you and I have the conversation a few weeks ago about? Um, I, I just want to touch on masonry on the checkerboard of the kingdom of the devil. I want to go back to the checkerboard of the kingdom of the devil momentarily, just to again recontextualize where we're at now, where we've evolved to this morphogenetic upswing or upshift that we're on the brink of orchestrating. Those of us who are meek of heart and who've positioned ourselves on that indivisible line and are um, taking courage with the wisdom of insecurity because to be a pioneer at this time and to speak truth and to stand in truth requires an unbearable amount of, it creates an unbearable amount of insecurity because the false light matrix serves to bolster and support and endorse and sanction you if you are if you have one foot in that in that camp it'll give you what you feel you need to feel secure but if you are standing in pure truth you know that you have to remove yourself altogether from that line you have to be standing in the still point which is deeply insecure space and sasha can i say too i've got a poem to share just about what you're talking about i know about. you do and i'm going to i i do know that and i will exactly come to that let me finish my no, thought, if you don't mind. But it's, it's what thought. you're talking about. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, slight, slightly thrown there. I'll, I'll try, try to calibrate again. What, what I was getting at was that the checkerboard of the kingdom of the devil is what set the stage for um, us to make that determination to step off the checkerboard of the kingdom of the devil. And that's where the individuation, that's where the alchemization uh, of the of the of the Neanderthal into the angelic human occurs when we recognize that playing into Shiva and Shakti, playing into the dialectic, playing into the checkerboard is keeping you on the checkerboard. So at any given point, your point of emancipation of transcendence or transmutation is where we recognize that that checkerboard is in fact 
um, the matrix. It is the trick. It is the trap. So yeah. having said that, you've got a, a record, ancestral record of um, masonry. It's in your blood. That's what I find is interesting about you because you're a very transcendent person. You've really, you've really thrown all of that stuff off out of your blood song. And I think that takes a superhuman effort. In fact, I know it does. You mentioned to me, I think it was you mentioning to me that these artifacts historically have also been transacted and traded between Masonic lodges. Yeah, that's correct. I, yes. I'm really interested in, in just the touching on this subject because these artifacts that the Masonic lodges around the world over best accounts, a couple of hundred years at least, have been involved in trading and transacting um, are totems, but they're very powerful totems, and they yeah. codify huge aspects of collective plasma harvest of humanity of energy. Can you just speak a little bit about that game, that chess game of moving artifacts within the Masonic um, uh, landscape and how that is played its own part through subterfuge in orchestrating chaos in and maintaining the false light matrix. Absolutely. Uh, yes, my father, I will just briefly explain. He was a Freemason, uh, 33 degrees. He also was uh, uh, in, involved in the Ordo Templi Orientis, also Grandmaster, and he was also Fraternitas Saturni. So he was really quite deeply involved. Uh, also different lodge, which was around in the Second World War. I don't go into detail, it's too complex, but um, so, so his job or, or what he did for the lodges was he was traveling the world together with my mom and they would uh, purchase artifacts which would, would have been auctioned in different parts of the world. Now, these kind of artifacts, it was really important and they were already kind of <laughs> uh, strangely um, provided, let's say, by some of the museums and also Warburg Insti Institute, for example, in London, has a, a, a huge uh, a collection. And some of these uh, artifacts would end up in these private auctions, so which then would go into the hands of the Rothschilds or Rockefeller or whichever elitist family they are. And it was very important uh, to keep those artifacts in uh, in those hands of, of the elitists. They didn't want them to go into the museum or be beneficial for us to, to understand the powers of, of, of these items uh, which was connected to it. Uh, so uh, it was, there were tools which were tools to enhance their energy in magic. Magic was used, of course, in Egypt, for example, for 1500 years, it was their religion. So they knew all about how to work with matter. Um, and uh, uh, so one of these artifacts, or three more like, uh, came from Turkey. One actually was auctioned in, uh, uh, purchased on an auction in, in Egypt. The other two came from Turkey. One actually came from Gobekli Tepe of all places. And the other one came from Priyen, which is uh, near Didim in, uh, in Turkey. Now, this technology was known and also the uh, archeologists uh, were uh, instructed by, their, uh, by the company who would support it financially. They would sponsor the archeological digs. And this company was no other than Siemens AG, an electronics company. So, um, when I when I researched this, I always wondered why are they so keen and uh, why would they be sponsoring all these archaeological digs? So then I found out that uh, CERN, for example, the Large Hadron Collider, uh, their technology is actually based on ancient knowledge, and uh, and these kind of artifacts were a really big part of uh, the Large Hadron Collider, the the, uh, the the structure of it. Um, so just to see to explain that, as you already mentioned, these artifacts can amplify an enormous amount of energy yeah. and can have an effect on our matrix around the world. So, and this artificial matrix was created mainly by these kind of um, artifacts. So, so they were not- 
Yes. Let me let me let me just jump in there. I think I heard you say that one of these highly prized uh, auctioned artifacts turned out to be a, a critical component to the superhadron collider. That's what I heard you say. Exactly. That is and right. you're saying it's a, it was a mechanical engineered mechanical component, yeah. or it was something that was paramagnetic and contained certain frequencies and had to be in proximity. And you just go into that a little bit more. Yes. So this these items were not created uh, as such by by uh, civilization which was on Earth. So many people believe that it was extraterrestrial kind of uh, technology being buried in the ground uh, for safekeeping. Uh, so, but there were records about it, and these records were connected to, to for example, uh, and found on the surrounding fields of those uh, areas. Um, of, of the temples. So, and farmers would dig them up because uh, by just uh, 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 working with their field, they would stumble about the, uh, the, the little clay tablets which would contain all this kind of information. So, what they did then when I was there, for example, they asked all the farming community to put all the clay tablets which carried all the information about these items uh, into the local museum to exhibit it. So, and of course, sure enough, just a few days before the exhibition started, uh, someone broke into the museum and stole all of those kind of clay tablets um, and nothing else, just the tablets. <laughs> so all the valuable stuff was still there. So that kind of, you know, and these kind of situations is, that's not, it, you know, there's so many similar situations. So it is really, really important that people understand that there is a huge, um, network of 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 this this elitists and archaeologists who are very often sadly involved in it and also our history is of course completely uh, untrue in many many ways so they make history fit to their needs and that's the other thing right so we, yeah uh, so anyway coming back to these kind of items um two of those were created what we believed uh, was some form of meteorite material so uh, highly magnetic and uh, and they would have a shape of a um almost like a spearhead uh, but the number nine was very important because all carvings or they were not carvings they were almost like indentations uh they would be like yoni shaped or diamond shaped um uh, 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 patterns on these kind of three-sided objects uh, so the number three and nine was always very very important in all of the kind of artifacts which were connected to that specific site um, so now uh, when i started to research a lot of things happened and uh, uh, I don't, I don't go into, I, I was really in a difficult position to leave even Turkey because they wanted to arrest us. And uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, hard feeling before I even entered Turkey. I was living next door to Bamor. Um I was on the estate and I witnessed a lot of things because of the connection which I had to my father, I had access to certain individuals, let's say, and I learned very quickly that I could withdraw the information from the Scottish Freemasons, but uh, I, I was actually um, underground for quite uh, some time, so I had to go to Spain, to Turkey, to just kind of uh, get, get, get away from Britain. Um, however, that's a different story. So yes, uh, there is a completely corrupt network in place which will and and still does uh try tries to to uh, to to um to stop us from actually knowing the truth that's what it comes so, down to so interestingly that was my next question i mean that as far as balmoral is concerned in scotland um i also know um a very dear friend of mine who is um aristocratic and who is very close grew up close to the royal family in britain um, in fact, he's right now a guest at my home in Bali, beloved friend of mine. And he's um, he has told me in the past what he's witnessed at Balmoral. And one of the things he mentioned, I remember he actually phoned me from horseback one time from Balmoral saying, what the fuck? He said, there's these black pyramids all over Balmoral on the estate, these little black pyramids. 
Um, he mm. said, check out from Google and see if you can see them. In any event, for sure, some real Babylonian mysterium um, black arts taking place in that part of the world. So your family and the, the flame keepers, Masonic flame keepers in your family have been part of that tradition of sequestering the, um, the, the, the knowledge, so to speak. Um, and your your father, what was his ranking? He was a 33 degree Freemason. Uh, he also was a Grand Master of uh, numerous other lodges. So his uh, his ranking, he actually came from a Chinese background. So uh, my surname is Ling, and uh, we, we are connected to the Chiang Kai-shek kind of dynasty, uh, Marie Ling. That's maybe someone you know. She was very. Uh, uh, she was had an enormous influence uh, in America. This uh, President Roosevelt. So and uh, yes. So this kind of dragon line was very deeply rooted in our family. So interesting. And your 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 father um, your father left this world in mysterious circumstances. Yes, there are many speculations. Uh, he he had to disappear because. Uh, in a term of events, he decided not to hand over some of the artifacts, especially one, and uh, he decided to basically turn against his own kind, his own lodge. Uh, so um, he sorry, sorry, brother. He he did so because he recognized at that time that those artifacts being traded um, represented something that could be of epochal. Um, destructivity yes. and and he did not want to participate in that so in a sense he he intervened he, he interceded in that event and then stepped back out of i mean that that's an almighty act of courage because my god he must have known the capacity for this brotherhood yes absolutely and she knew that he couldn't escape forever uh because one of the lodges which i uh kind of mentioned uh, they would have a sacrific sacrificial kind of uh, lottery, as I call it, where they would sacrifice every so so many years along the line. Uh, they would, would draw a ball and then they would kind of uh, have a sacrifice amongst the members, including the Grandmaster. Um, so it was a very warped and quite sinister uh, um, lodge, which was known to people like Adolf Hitler, for example, who wanted to be a member of this lodge. Um, and he actually tortured one of the members to find out how he could be possibly be a part of it. Uh, so it, it, it was just, it's just crazy stuff. But anyway, um, so my father then decided to not hand over this item. And he said, uh, he, basically, uh, I, I ended up with it for a little while. But then I sent it off for safe, safekeeping because it was too risky for me to, to have it. And I got into so, so much trouble at the time. So, um, however, uh, this third item, and in Gobekli Tepe, this is one of the reasons why they are investigating the whole area in the first place. Uh, because this, this area, Klaus, uh, Klaus Schmidt, for example, was, a, a, was a, one of the wars, he's, he's dead now. Um, he died in 2014, and he actually, I believe, was one of the people who uh, came very close to the truth um, about the uh, the cave systems or the, the underground tunnel system, which actually connected the tapis to each other. And uh, many of the uh, excavation area now um, has has been closed off because people were asking too many questions. Okay. So, so yes. Uh, Break 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 this down for us. So the mm -hmm. tepes. I've been to Gobekli Tepe and Karahan Tepe. I've spent time there. And when I was uh, recently there at Karahan Tepe, as I've mentioned to you, uh, I was there two days after, three days after they discovered the oldest artifact in on academic history. And the artifact was there, exposed. So it was myself, my mother, one other person, two guys with guns, military guys, and an archaeologist at the site. This is a, yeah. a couple of months ago. And um, I did see the artifact. I'll ask my editor to put it up here um, uh, uh, on the slide here. But it, it was a, an, an uh, artifact, I think I may have showed you, about a man holding his penis. And that was yeah. the 
oldest known artifact exposed to academic light, discovered two or three days before I was in Karahan Tepe. They photo I, we photographed it illicitly. My mother snatched a photograph when the guys with the guns were telling us to get away. We're not allowed to even look in that in that site. And um, you're saying to me that the there are tunnel systems connecting the tepees. Um, and we know that the the stones, the paramagnetic stones, essentially are gongs and are vibrational technologies, sound technologies. So just for this audience, break this down and put it into context. You've got the two oldest known civilizations, according to academic record, discovered. Go back to Tepe, Karahan Tepe. They are yes. under the ground, so they're being dug up. You know, they're digging them up and revealing them. That's um, right. And what was the point? What are the tunnels? What was taking place underground? Who built that technology and why? Okay, so the tunnels uh, were, were had two specific reasons. One, I mean, when you were in Karan Tepe, you could see, obviously, there is a big uh, kind of a, a buzz and almost carved out of the bedrock where the, uh, the pillars uh, have been carved out as well. So most of them are, are carved out of the bedrock too. So, and this particular area was filled with water. And so when it was filled uh, on specific days, because it was oil, don't forget, they were absolutely incredibly knowledgeable when it came, came to astrology and astronomy. So they would know exactly uh, how to tune these kind of stones. And they would go and submerge themselves into the water and would absorb that specific frequency. So that knowledge was absolutely amazing. It was not just for healing purposes, but it was also for, uh, for knowledge, uh, so that you would be connected to the cosmic water. And uh, it's all about keeping that memory within us uh, very active, that frequency which connects us to the cosmic oceans, to the, to the point of creation. So that was in rough, uh, roughly, why why water was so important for the tepes um, and pyramids or any kind of in that respect, uh, most of the ancient sites have either water running underneath or have some form of a well next to it, um, even here in Britain. So the tunnels had a specific reason. So the, these civilizations would maintain existing above the ground, but certain certain events would happen where they would have to go underneath ground as well. For example, the solar events, which I mentioned earlier, in connection with the eclipse, and also the Great Flood, which would make it impossible, or, because Gobekli Tepe is one of the higher areas, and uh, the other ones are, are lower down. Uh, so they, they would be more impacted by the water for example yeah. but the main reason is that the tunnels are existing is most of the tunnels would contain water as well not just for people to go into safe safe ground but they would be all connected with water and the resonance would go literally from the uh, Euphrates and from the tigris these are the two rivers which flow basically side to side most of the uh, 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 ancient ancient uh, uh, sites uh, so they would be all connected, and now I think uh, it was the Euphrates where they have found all these amazing tunnel systems. Some of them, which some of the uh, archaeologists that I'm talking to, uh, believe that they are connected to the to the tepes as well. So it's like a huge tunnel system, and many of the tunnels have been actually closed off. Um, and and the local people avoid this kind of areas because there's this humming sound within the, the tunnels and they find it quite spooky because they think something and of course the government will put out these kind of stories that uh, these uh, they're, they're quite aware of of um, how superstitious Turkish people are and they would say oh this is like uh, the home of the great snake or, or whatever so they wouldn't enter these kind of areas but um, uh, Erhan, which was one of the archaeologists who I was talking about, uh, talking to, he sent me two images, and it's a shame that I haven't sent it to you. Um, two images, one is from a cave inside and, uh, and about a king who was uh, connected to the water. So that's, uh, that's a zone of silence. That's in Mexico. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the uh, uh, 
this particular cave is quite important because it resonates an incredible frequency. And when you enter this cave, you literally feel like uh, that you have no orientation. So it does do something with your mind. Um, it alters your, 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 your frequency to such extent that you are completely disorientated and it takes about a couple of hours, even when you're outside the cave, just to get kind of grounded again. So these kind of areas are just dotted around all the, cap uh, all the tepees and nobody talks about it. Um, so th these are very fundamental, and very, very important uh, fre frequency carriers, which were all part of this enormous area of all the temples. And I, yes, yeah, I, I do believe that there is definitely um, a huge connection here between the, um, the land and the cosmos. I mean, this is absolutely was was totally in their belief system anyway. Bravo, bravo. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. Dr. Joe, kindly um, give us your assessment, your thoughts about what we've been discussing here and uh, and your, yeah, your final sort of sentiments. So. It's only just connected with me, Alex. And you know this story very well. But uh, last year at the um, the 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 summer equinox, what do we call it now? The <laughs> solstice. I went to Egypt, and I was just very much called there. I'm a quarter of Egyptian, and I was very much called there at this time. I was going to go to Glastonbury, but I didn't. And for to cut a very long story short, I was able to get into the second pyramid and Kafra, I got there very, very late. I was very much guided there, where there were and about five minutes before closing time, I went inside. It hums, it hums and people don't talk about it. I was extremely lucky because uh, my brothers there recognized me just as it was closing, was very lucky to be able to, you know, I didn't expect this, I was meditating, it was a completely overwhelmingly powerful experience. But I see, was allowed to lie in the sarcophagus for a couple of minutes just while they were closing because it was empty, it was the perfect time. And I'm telling you, it's like having 50,000 volts go through your body. But these places hum and nobody's talking about it, just like Alex said. That is the overwhelming thing about this place, it's not their shape, it's the sound. Interesting, very interesting. Um, AJ, give me give me your your summary thoughts on all that we've been discussing here. We've been going into you know, Freemasonry, talking about Babylonian priesthoods, talking about the status quo, talking about military, about, about cult programming, talking about um, massive um, cosmic events, and ultimately the need for you and I, of uh, the fellowship of man, to to. Uh, muster itself at this end of time into that still point and find our own uh, superluminal, supernatural status amongst the fellowship of galactic intelligences. I mean, surely this is ultimately about how we move off the plane of this earth into a galactic um, a confederacy, so to speak. To speak about in that context, the galactic view of, of where we're at and summarize your thoughts on this conversation. Yeah, it's really interesting actually to bring that up because um, I just only, I only have to use the experiences that people on my current courses uh, in the last couple of months and the people that have come to my talks, people that have come to my events, the experiences they've had in terms of connecting galactically with their soul family, like often for the first time or experience even what it is. Um, it's been really, really pro profound. And I think um, all the things you could kind of mentioned there, like everything from, uh, you know, ancient artifacts to megalithic sites to the Freemasonry to awaken, like to all of it, like the knowledge and around this and the greater knowledge around frequency, vibration, sound, water, structured water, what it all means, how it all coalesces uh, and how that then connects us to our galactic self. But like, people are very much awakening and have gone for a remembrance of that right now. I was literally seeing it in people and speaking to multiple people daily about it. So I think like that in itself is just evidence, all the evidence we need to show like how humanity is shifting. So like what we're doing right here um, as a collective is of the utmost paramount to kind of join a lot of those dots for people and unlock further DNAs in people, uh, unlock further gifts in people uh, and unlock that um, connection between them, the higher self, their galactic self, you know, the, and, and, and where they sit in all this and, and people stepping into those roles 
as a as a result. I think that's another big thing I'm seeing. You know, we've got millions of people right now who's like souls like sat here, just like, I I know I've got a mission, but I just don't quite know what it is yet. Like they're just like sat there like this. You know, there's just millions of people like that right now. So things like this and these conversations are so important because it's just helping people just catapult out of that current position into you know it's stepping into those roles and what they're about and, and that deeper and greater remembrance and, and if it's if if this kind of language i guess uh is fairly new to you but it resonates it's for a reason um it's it's all part of this like divine path and journey that we're all on individually um you know awakening to our, our true self and what we came here to do uh and you know where we're from and what we're about so yeah i think you know, well, we say it often, but it is literally the most exciting time to be alive. And, you know, people get frigging excited about it. Truly, truly. Well, beautifully stated, AJ. Thank you, brother. Really appreciate your sentiments and your and your bearing. Thank you. Uh, Medine, uh, please uh, send us off with uh, send us off with your poem. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I was just thinking as you're talking to AJ, bees hum, you know, the, the resonance when you're in standing under bees you know it has a really powerful effect on you and so that's a good example of humming as well I think but thank you so much for the opportunity to share this poem I really resonated with what you said earlier Sasha when you said that um people standing with one foot in one camp and one foot in another camp they're sort of vulnerable to be um sort of misled energetically you know with with their choices and it really uh relates to the poem so i loved how you said that uh so this poem is called moral decay losing our way and generally speaking i'm very positive about humanity at the moment and you know we we are winning the light is winning and we are going to win you know it's proclaimed by the divine and by mother earth that we are going to uh, you know succeed in our victory of light but um, I just was really uh, felt passionate about writing this poem, which is the 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 cracks, you know, in the in the in the um, humanity at the moment, which is uh, about the moral decay and losing our way. So moral decay, losing our way, when there is no ability to discern the basic difference between right or wrong. Moral decay, losing our way, when the ability to enforce personal boundaries diminishes. Moral decay losing our way when the personal responsibility for thoughts, words, and actions is lost. Moral decay losing our way when any form of hurt or harm to others is acceptable on any level. Moral decay losing our way when e everything goes and all lines of decency are blurred. Moral decay losing our way when society becomes open to everything and loses its ability to voice the word no. Moral decay losing our way when the ability to self-discipline and self-determine one's journey becomes lost in the throng of the crowd. Moral decay losing our way when our mind, our hearts, our humanity become overtaken by an external force. Moral decay losing our way when we lose the ability to simply care about ourselves or others. Moral decay losing our way when the inner voice of reason and intuition becomes drowned out by the noise of many. Moral decay losing our way, when the peer pressure to conform, to obey, to be silenced, overtakes the will to speak and the will to be heard. Moral decay losing our way, when freedom becomes a distant concept that has been lost in translation. Moral decay losing our way, when a soul loses sight of their connection to the divine or the noble voice that speaks within. Moral decay losing our way when the strict guardianship of our defenseless and our children becomes a distant memory. This is when a society is lost. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that. Um, before we sign off, I just wanted, Alex, given that I'm in Mexico um, and given that this very enigmatic slide was given to me, um, the zone of silence. Um, it looks incredibly enigmatic. What exactly we're dealing with here? Okay, <clears throat> the zone of silence is where the uh, eclipse has the longest, uh, the, the shadow has the longest duration, which is four minutes twenty eight point one seconds. Um, so what we're looking at is some form of a tabletop 
uh, mountain, which is uh, just uh, pretty much almost in the center of it. Uh, so very close by, you can see that there is a laboratory uh, of, of the uh, biosphere uh, because the whole area is, is so uh, extremely uh, charged uh, electromagnetically. So it's, it's quite amazing. There's a huge magnetic field. Uh, so your compass is just spinning and spinning. Um, the vegetation, the plants are abnormally uh, uh, large, and and uh, it also has an impact on on the on the uh, insects and, and animals around. So wow. that's that's why they're studying this area. Um, it is probably one of the most uh, conspiracy uh, uh, rich uh, area in in Mexico because everything from UFO sightings to uh, underground uh, tunnels uh, to the conspiracy that there is an arc uh, underneath that area. So there's all sorts of different stories about it. Um, I, I was drawn to it because of uh, the information I had from my father way back, uh, that we're going now like 30 odd years, uh, who was mentioning that eclipse in, in Mexico in, in connection with Megiddo. So, um, and that's why it's so important. However, so that area is exactly where I'm going to be on, on the 8th of uh, April, uh, which is just in, uh, in about a month's time. And uh, so I'm not going alone. So there are four people who are going to, to uh, uh, come with me to, you to might see. Add, you might add me there. I think, I'm, I think I might just get on a plane and make my way there. I, I think you will not regret it. It, it will be, I, we all feel like something is there. There are so many things happening. Uh, meteorites, for example, they're so drawn to this area. They're just crashing into the area all the time, tiny, tiny ones, you know. Uh, but uh, you get a lot of meteor hunters who come all the time to the area to pick up the meteorites, you know, from the ground. Um, okay. Game on, game on. Uh, I'll yeah, look at the logistics please. there, Alex, and try and join you there for Lazarus and see if we can do some filming there. That could be very interesting. I think that would be very, very interesting. The only thing is, uh, which is slightly against us, is that sometimes the GPS signal cuts out completely in the area. So I don't know how my friend, a friend of mine who was just there a few months ago, uh, she traveled with a motorbike through the area, and she said it's it's okay. It can be temperamental, but if you if you have a good technology with you, you should be okay, especially when you are. Understood. Very good. Well, friends, that's it. We're well over our time here. I just want to thank uh, AJ uh, Roberts. I want to thank uh, Maydeen uh, from Arise Humanity. I want to th thank Dr. Joanne Whitaker and, of course, uh, Dr. Alex Ling. This has been a fantastic conversation and I think an important one. And I think we should possibly look towards uh, having another conversation on the flip side of the ape. You know, maybe give it a, a couple of weeks to see what actually transpires, planet globally. But I think we might be able to look over our shoulder and see some extraordinary um, confluence of events and circumstances that uh, will endorse and support everything that we've been um, uh, conjecturing here today. So, friends, thank you very much for joining me. I'm going to play out um, just with a very short um, a couple of minutes piece the, of my recent trip to to Gobekli Tepe and Karahan Tepe. And uh, because I think it's of interest to the audience in the context of what uh, much of what Alex was speaking about, to be able to see some of those uh, images and spaces. So, friends, thank you so very much for joining me. If you wish, uh, you can uh, depart or you can watch this this short clip. But uh, very happy to have met all of you. Let me bring you onto the gallery view. Uh, Alex, thank you so much. Medine, thank you. PJ, great meeting you, brother. And Dr. Joe, lovely meeting you. Very good. Stand by, friends. This seems to be the highest point at Karen Chappie. The extraordinary thing about this, uh, this ancient biblical landscape is that, A, it's the oldest known sort of record of a civilization that we're discovering here, um, 13,000 to 15,000 years ago. Consider that um, the Sumerian civilization, 4,000 BC, more or less, um, hitherto has been acknowledged by academia as being the oldest kind of recorded 
civilization as well. It just seems like the more we uh, the more we play this game of time, the more it eludes us. Who knows? One rather suspects that there are other places in this world that are millions of years old, many hundreds of thousands of years old, including civilizational vestiges and remains. I guess that's the one thing about revelation about where we're at is nobody knows a fucking thing. That's the truth of the matter. All the governments and um, ministries of you know, archaeology and anthropology poncing around pretending as though we have the faintest fucking idea about anything, which we don't. Zero point of civilization. Right there. Right there. That's the zero point. How about that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's the that's the artifact. Um, that's the artifact. Yes. Yeah. About five foot tall, I seem to recall. Um, and that's the first photograph ever taken of it by my mother and syndicated illegally, illicitly to the world through my broadcasting. Um yeah. because as the military people try to shoo us away, uh, the old archaeologist said to me, My God, people probably never get to see this. It'll be taken away by the helicopters, but you know, I do, who knows? Yeah. Maybe we find itself to one of those auctions. <laughs> most likely the case. This has to be one of yes. the most extraordinary places in the world. It's taken pretty much all day to get here and a hell of a long time to climb to the top. But this is the the mound of the gods, the mountain of the gods, uh, Nemrut in Turkey. Um, the most extraordinary thing, I've had a bird um, accompanying all the way up and all the way down. He's on a rock behind me. You can hardly see him. Um, I'll try and get some footage of him. But it's the most extraordinary thing because th this bird is the only living creature I've seen pretty much all day. This extraordinary mountain of the gods. Uh, you have to go back to the time of uh, King Nebuchadnezzar and beyond. Uh, to get a kind of grip on the story uh, behind this space. But hey, I'm here and uh, trying to share this experience with you as best as possible. It's just too, too magnificent. Yeah. <laughs> so we just uh, dismounted these beautiful horses. Christ knows how they got up here. But we managed to somehow. These are the extraordinary um, peaks and formations, and you know, not forgetting, of course, the Cappadocia. It turns out is the was the biggest um, was the biggest province of the entire Roman Empire. And that's rather a staggering uh, thought. But there you have it. And this is the place where Alexander the Great also uh, sent his armies and subdued subjugated the locals planted his um his prefect here and um peace reigned until the end of alexander's life which wasn't let's face it a very long life at all that's about the fourth fourth century uh, and this place absolutely reeks of biblical history and then of course when you look at these formations as well and you consider um stories about you know Mountains are old forests and mushrooms, shrooms, large <laughs> 50 meter, 100 meter, 200 meter high mushrooms. It's very hard to know what, what the truth is in this. But I'll tell you what, when you look at this, when you look at this landscape, it very much feels as though this could have been a sort of pre diluvian or whatever um, forest of sorts. But the fact of the matter is that it, it's quite possible that huge craft of hundreds of kilometers or thousands of kilometers long did at some point come and mine and deforest earth when the oxygen levels were vastly different to today and when um by best accounts the atmosphere was a great deal higher and um giants roamed the surface of the earth and um you know pre-dinosaur even arguably you know 60 
five million years ago, 200 million years ago. And so we can only guess at this stuff. But the point is, I've got no issue with looking at incredible formations like this and thinking, well, perhaps this was de a deforested uh, by alien craft or, you know, these are the excavation remnants of mining excavations and extraordinary uh, events that occurred millions and millions of years ago. I think we need to, the point being, of course, that we need to be open to these possibilities because, well, we know that the, uh, we know that the Sabbateans who've controlled academia and have controlled the Vatican complex, the Vatican library, and all of the kind of royal geographical societies and, and uh, 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 the portals of learning. Oh, Christ, my horse is pissing on my foot. I have to step back a little bit. But the point being, we know how academia has been utterly, utterly corrupted. And the true telling of who we are and what we are, and even what our planet is all about, has been lost to us. Um, I rather suspect that at this great time of revelation, this stuff is going to uh, surface. And I think it's going to happen in the next two or three years. I think by the year 2030, to be sure, we're going to be inhabiting a very, very different world with a very different understanding of who we are, where we come from. Look at my beautiful all right well that's us wish me luck we have to somehow get to the bottom of this valley again and i'll bid you adieu <laughs>